Um, today, we're going to continue the morning presentations with a session on how Antarctica and the Southern Ocean affect global climate and ocean circulation, and another session on Southern high latitude biota and ecosystems, and a final session on how a shifting ice sheet might affect sedimentation and biogeochemical cycles. In the afternoon, we're going to have two breakout sessions. The first is a repeat of yesterday's format where the discussions will be session specific and focused on identifying science priorities and capabilities and a final interdisciplinary breakout room that will be more free flowing discussion about the differences and commonalities between necessary capabilities that each session has identified. And we might have a couple of tweaks to that, so stand by. Um, we're now going to begin with session four. Ted Maxim will be moderating the session, and if all presenters for session four could please come sit on stage, that would be great. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ted. All right, thank you, Paula. Um, so our first speaker for this session, um, oh, sorry, this session is focused on the interaction between Antarctica and the Southern Ocean and global climate and ocean circulation. Our first speaker for this session is Sarah Perkey. Sarah is an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Got it. Okay, thanks. Push for it. Oh, coming. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, well, first, I can start by thanking um, the organizers for having me today. Um, and today, I get to introduce the section here talking about um, Antarctica and the Southern Ocean and the effects it has on global climate and ocean circulation. Maybe. Uh, oh, there it goes. Um, okay, so uh, to start off, um, when we're thinking about the role that the Southern Ocean plays, uh, we have to start with this introductory slide, looking at the meridional overturning circulation. I like this one by Tally et al. In, from 2013, that really puts Antarctica in the center because Antarctica and the Southern Ocean play a really key role um, in the north to south um, transport of heat and other ocean properties throughout the global ocean. Um, and it's really important to note um, that most of the global ocean below 1,000 meters is going to be ventilated in the Southern Ocean. And it really plays a key role um, in the overall ability for the atmosphere and ocean to communicate with each other. So in this figure, um, it has Antarctica in the middle, and it shows some of the key pathways uh, that Antarctica is able to get water from the surface, um, communication with the atmosphere, and then back into the deep ocean. Um, and really a key point from this talk is to think about how the Southern Ocean in Antarctica mediates the strength of this meridional overturning circulation. And to do that, I wanna focus on two key regions. One is, at, is on the continental shelf and looking at the interaction between the ocean ice bathymetry and atmosphere. And the second one is within the ACC, looking at the role that the overturning circulation plays in this larger um, formation of intermediate waters in the upwelling of deep waters. So going to uh, the Antarctic shelf, um, we've seen versions of this figure before, um, but I wanna point out some key features. So first, um, this region is extremely, um, key to climate because um, of uh, reasons that we've already heard, which is it can control the rate that we get this warm deep water, which is shown um, in red there, up onto the shelf and close to the glaciers and therefore driving, accelerating or decelerating the rate of melting that we see of the glacial ice. Um, but in addition to that, it plays a key role in setting the quantity of sea ice and the export rates. And it also plays a really key role in setting the rate of deep water formation. Um, and so in this figure, we see um, that 
here. And I also want to point out that this is a very kind of dynamic, it's a very complicated, um, and it's a very um, coupled system where we have to think about the wind forcing. Um, we have to think about the sea ice production and transport, um, which is a non-trivial question that I think is still a very active area of research. We have to think about the slope exchange, which again is um, a complicated system where we have to think about many different timescales all the way down to the tidal timescales and mixing processes. And then we have to think about the ocean ice interaction at the front, which is also um, kind of emerging physics um, that we're trying to understand. Um, and then just to point out, we have talked a little bit about, um, slides are slow, uh, advance, I guess. There's some animation, sorry about that. Um, when we think about, uh, again, going back to the Antarctic bottom water formation, um, this water that is being exported um, is the largest volume wise of water being produced in the global ocean. And this is just a figure by Johnson et al. showing the spatial extent um, here showing depth range that that water primarily fills. So throughout most of the ocean, it's gonna be um, kind of two to 4,000 4, meters. Um, and really the data challenges here is that it's a very coupled system. It's a harsh environment. Um, and the dynamics are very complicated. Um, and the second reason, region that I wanted to kind of introduce is looking at the dynamics across the ACC. Um, so in the Southern Ocean, we have one of the strongest currents in the world that goes all the way around the continent. And here, um, the dynamics are uh, primarily driven by the wind-driven circulation. And so what that's shown is these yellow arrows on the top, and then I've put some dots on, on above showing the uh, meridional variation in the wind strait. And so a little physical oceanography 101, because I know we're an interdisciplinary group. But here what matters is actually the variation going from the strongest wind source in the middle. As we move north, it gets a little bit less. And because of the Coriolis force, um, that's gonna end up in water converging and downwelling. Into the south, um, we're going to have a, a decrease in the wind strength, which is going to allow for really strong um, Ekman upwelling. And that is what really allows this pathway of carbon coming from the deep ocean going to the surface. And then also the formation of the intermediate waters to the north, which allows us to uh, sequest anthropogenic heat into the deep ocean. And kind of the data challenges here is that it's somewhat remote um, in the Southern Ocean. And um, again, really large and small spatial scales matter. So I think in the last decade, it's become increasingly clear that even on the submeso scale um, plays a really key role in setting the strength of this overturning circulation. So now moving into um, observations and kind of what um, I think we need moving forward. So I divided this into two categories. Um, the first one, thinking about what we need to monitor the Southern Ocean heat and carbon. And really the scientific quick question here is what is the net ocean heat tank, heat uptake in carbon sink um, that's coming from the Southern Ocean? Um, and to do this, uh, what we really need is climate quality data, which means we really care about the highest accuracy we need sustained observations because this is a decadal signal. Um, and to do this, we're gonna need a combination of autonomous and uh, high quality ship-based observations. And so what's shown on the right is the observational network that we primarily use right now to monitor ocean heat and carbon uptake, which is a combination of Argo floats um, and the ghost ship repeat hydrography, which is in mines. And for the most part, I think we have a pretty good start on this system. We just need to continue and expand it into the future. And so what's shown here and what the last two decades of Argo data has shown us is that the Southern Ocean plays a very key role in both of these processes. So on the top is showing the global trend in ocean heat content from Argo. And then on the right is showing um, the zonal mean. Um, and what we can see is that these two key regions kind of south of 30 play a substantial role in the net uptake of heat that the ocean is able to take up. And so again, just to remind everybody, the oceans take up over 90% of the net anthropogenic warming that we've seen. And so when we talk about global warming, we're actually talking about ocean warming and that ocean warming is going into the Southern Ocean. And so it, in terms of global climate, um, 
we really need to be able to monitor the signal, this how much heat is going south of 30 degrees south into the ocean. And then when we look at the deep ocean, again, going back to the Antarctic bottom water, at the moment, um, over the past couple of decades, we're mainly monitoring that from ship-based hydrography. Um, and that is the figure that you see on the left. And so while it's smaller than the surface ocean, still a fair amount of heat is going into the Southern Ocean due to changes that we're seeing around the Southern Ocean. And just to point out that while the last couple of decades we've looked at repeat hydrography, the figure on the right is from Johnson um, at all 2019, and he was using deep Argo data in the Brazil basin to start to monitor changes um, from, the, from autonomous platforms. And just to remind myself, this is a picture of a CTD to kind of point out that um, this program, Deep Argo, is not independent of, of ships um, quite yet. We still need it. And then finally, last but not least, I've been showing trends. But to kind of understand the dynamics here, we really need to know the year-to-year -year variability. So this is showing what we can do with Argo-based products is actually look at the year-to-year -year variability in ocean heat content. Um, and then moving on to carbon, recently we have started um, putting autonomous uh, pH sensors um, on floats, and this is results from um, the SOCOM array, um, which is showing both um, uh, ship-based estimates of carbon fluxes in the background and then the float data as those small red circles. And what's being shown here is, first of all, there's a huge gradient from south to north um, of carbon flux from the ocean to the atmosphere. And all those up, upwelling regions is going to control the amount of old water that's reaching the surface, allowing for carbon outgassing. And then north is going to be where you're having those waters being formed, and it's allowing for the subduction of water and the uptake of anthropogenic heat or anthropogenic carbon. And it's just important to, to point out that the background signal here is huge. And so when we're talking about the anthropogenic signal, it's a really small deviation of the background um, circulation that we still um, need to understand better. And also the difference between the left and the right is the summer and the winter. And it points out that the winter processes here are very key. And at the moment, it's, it's still very difficult to get ships um, into the ice zone in the winter. And again, just to point out, you know, while I am focusing a little bit on autonomous um, measurements here, these, especially the um, ocean chemistry, is not decoupled from ship-based observations. In order to make these estimates from the floats, um, we're only measuring one of the carbon parameters. We need to estimate at least one of the other ones. And these are coming from empirical relationships that we're still finding from ship-based data. So it's very key that we get into the ice zone during winter. Um, and so last, looking at what I did talk about is what I think we're doing well and that we need to continue in the future, which is monitoring ocean heat um, and carbon. I think the real questions and um, where we're going in the future is to understand the mechanisms that are controlling the MOC in this rate flux. Um, in here, going back to these pictures, it's talking about what are the level levers here? What, what allows this to be stronger or weaker? And how do each of these parts of the system kind of play into that? And so the questions here are, are fundamentally, what are the variabilities of the circulation? And here circulation means this meridional returning circulation, the strength of the AC and the strength of the various fronts um, and currents around Antarctica that we, we need to understand. Um, and we need this to really understand what the heat fluxes are onto the shelf and its variability. And think about the variability in the deep water formation and think about um, the freshwater budget. And here really the challenge is being the fact that it really does span um, very large scales, it's seasonal dependent, um, and it's extreme environment, and it's a very coupled system. And so my last slide here is just thinking about what, we, what I think we need in the future. Um, and so yesterday we heard a lot about kind of the needs of the shelf in adjacent regions. Um, and it is a key region, obviously, and we heard over and over again that we need to get under the ice and we need to get under the ice in the winter, so that's not new. Um, I do want to um, think about or present to this group to think about the fact that it is really a coupled system. And so when we're designing our observational network, we need to be able to resolve all of the pieces together. Um, and so in the exercise yesterday, for example, we're thinking about prioritizing what we need to observe, but um, 
it is uh, key that kind of all of those pieces come together and that we understand that we're not gonna get the ocean heat flux correctly without understanding the front slope structure or the dynamics under the shelf and the bathymetry and the sea ice and the wind. And so we should think about that when designing our observational network. I also put hydrography on here because we didn't hear that much about hydrography. There's still a lot of things that we um, need to look at um, from ship-based observations, ocean tracers being one of them. So the figure on the right um, is some recent work looking at CFC data, which is telling us kind of when, how water is ventilated throughout the global ocean. And using this, we can also kind of look at the changes in circulation. And um, we need to extend Argo. So the figure on the bottom is just showing some work we did with the deep Argo under ice in the winter, showing kind of the evolution and how the Antarctic bond water is moving. Um, and what we're gonna hear about here through the panelists is, is kind of what we need to do looking at past climates to, under, to inform us about our current climate. Um, and just making a plug that when we're thinking about the observations, we also think about the modeling community and how it's gonna help us answer these questions. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, we're gonna, we have three minutes for questions, which we'll read up from Slido. First question, uh, what observations can not be completed using autonomous systems and must be done from ship-based surveys? In the future, would it be possible that all measurements, all key measurements in this vein could be done um, with autonomous platforms? That is a great question. So. I try to touch on that a little bit. I think first off, no, I don't see a future where autonomous vehicles are gonna ever be decoupled from ships and that we're not gonna need uh, that ship grounding truth, even for the things that we can measure. And I say that from this climate perspective, I think as climate scientists, when we're looking at things like ocean heat uptake and carbon, we nowadays have the world looking at us. These need to be very precise. We need redundancies in the system. And we need climate quality. So I work in the sensor community. The sensors are getting better every day, but there are always problems with them. They drift and we just, you are always gonna need that grounding truth that's gonna come from people on ship taking the measurements. And then finally, I think there are a lot of things that we don't measure that are gonna be very, very challenging to measure autonomously. Tracers, isotopes, we're talking about glacier melt. You need to look at, at different um, variations and isotopes can tell you, tell you about stuff like that. Again, with the carbon system, um, until we have a really functioning alkalinity sensor, um, we're gonna definitely need to continue to get that carbon carbon budget from, from a combination of autonomous and ship base. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, how to promote the role of advanced technologies against ocean acidification and eutrophication and increase the key role of science and technology innovations? I mean, I think that there is investment, just like we are investing in our ships because of how the questions that we're looking at in the future, we need to be investing both in autonomous uh, sensors um, and in ships simultaneously. Um, so the technology is coming along. Um, but it's coming along through the community, investing a lot of time um, in development work and working closely with engineers um, and actually other disciplines um, across the board who are also trying to measure similar things in other regimes. Great, thank you. Um, that was the last question we had on Slido. Okay. All right, um, so our, we're gonna do a series of flash talks, five minute flash talks. Our first flash talk is gonna be given by Ed Brook. Ed is a university distinguished professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Science at, Ocean, at Oregon State University. Okay, hi everybody. Can you uh, let me know if you can't hear me? Um, I think you're muted still. Not muted on my end. I think you can hear me now. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Ed Brook. I'm a professor in uh, Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric Sciences at OSU. I'm also the director of a new entity. It's an NS NSF Science and Technology Center called the Center for Oldest Ice Exploration, which is uh, attempting to extend the length of the ice core record. I'm one of the two emissaries uh, from the ice core community at this meeting. You heard from Peter Neff um, yesterday. So I'm not gonna to talk today about work that we would do um, 
uh, directly using a ship, but I would like to talk about the intersection of uh, deep ice coring research and what's happening in the near future uh, with um, paleoceanography in the, in the Southern Ocean. The context here is the what we call the deep ice core records, not necessarily a well-defined term, but um, referring to, to data that go back through the last um, glacial maximum and in many cases much, much further. And there are a number of such cores. Most of them are shown on the, the map um, that you see on the left-hand side. And um, Ice cores are important in this context because they are sitting on the continent receiving information that's influenced by uh, things that happen in the Southern Ocean, of course. And they have certain advantages, uh, very high accumulation rates, very accurate chronologies, uh, but of course have the disadvantage of, of being uh, uh, far south on the continent and not certainly uh, not seeing everything. Um, uh, of course, another chief advantage of the ice core record is it tells us about the greenhouse gas history, which is uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about here. Um, there are two sort of big directions in the ice core community right now, um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about both of those uh, for this context. Um, one of them is trying to understand the history of uh, waste collapse during the last interglacial period uh, with the idea that that'll tell us something about the sensitivity of waste to future warming. There are a number of projects that are directed towards that problem. One is uh, on this map here, Skytrain Ice Rise, recently completed by the British Antarctic Survey. Another plan by the United States is where that red dot is, which is uh, the Hercules Dome project, hopefully drilled in the near future. The idea is to sort of look in the regions around waste to see if there's evidence for waste collapse. But of course, uh, if it did collapse, we're not going to drill into ice that's there. And so we're going to see sort of an ind indirect record of, of what was happening and, and, and clearly uh, understanding the history of waste uh, from the ocean is, is uh, a very, very central problem um, for climate science. The other direction that the ice core community is going now is trying to extend the record beyond the 800,000 year limit um, of the Dome C ice core, the European project um, at Dome C. And um, let's see if my animation arrows work here. Yeah. Okay, so the existing continuous ice core record goes back 800,000 years uh, through most of the 100K world. But there's intense interest in extending this further to get back through the mid Pleistocene transition and into the 40K world to understand what Antarctica was doing during that time period. And um, there are several international efforts directed at trying to find a place in Antarctica that can go back uh, in that that far. I think we'll get there. Uh, Coldex, the center I'm directing, is one of those efforts. Um, and there is another important project in Europe and, and in Australia going forward in that direction. So we're going to be uh, quite interested in um, uh, paleoceanographic records that cover that time period. And then we're also uh, finding older ice. In fact, we have ice that back to about 4 million years um, in uh, trapped in the mountain ranges in a place called Allen Hills in Antarctica, and we're exploring uh, other places uh, like that. That won't be continuous, but we're getting snapshots of climate that go back that far. And so understanding the Southern Ocean on those time scales uh, will certainly bring connections to that world. I'd like to go to the next slide if I can. I'm having trouble advancing. Okay, so I only have a minute or so left. Uh, I approached the question here uh, with a table um, to try to squeeze a lot of information in. And basically ice cores are telling us a lot of things about biogeochemistry, climate and, and glaciology, the types of things that Sarah talked about in the modern world, um, telling us about the greenhouse gas history, telling us about changes in biogeochemistry of iron, for example, that might influence ocean productivity, telling us, maybe about changes in sea ice through tracers like sodium in the ice. Uh, but we need to understand the ocean context for all of these records because we're only seeing uh, part of the system, obviously. And so it, it really 
getting a four-dimensional picture of the Southern Ocean biogeochemistry is key. Getting a complete picture of the history of the carbon budget around the Southern Ocean is key. Ice cores are also telling us a lot about climate and glaciology on the continent and off the continent. We now have records of mean ocean temperature from noble gas ratios in trapped air, which gets the things Sarah was talking about, about ocean heat content. We have very good data now about variability in temperature and accumulation across the ice sheet on uh, around a 100,000 year time scale which leads to questions about moisture transport and what controls stable isotopes in the atmosphere, what controls the linkages between climate at high latitudes uh, and the, the rest of the climate system. We can see things about ice dynamics from ice cores. Peter Neff talked about this. We need to understand how what we see it on the land is interacting with what's happening in the ocean. And then just to circle back to what I was talking about earlier, we really hope that we can extend the detailed ice core record back in time and uh, getting a full picture of what's happening needs. We also need to get detailed sediment records that go back over that time period. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, hopefully I didn't go over too long. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, so we're gonna save our questions for the end of the flash talks. Our next talk is by Alexander Howman. Alex is a research group leader at the Alfred Wegener Institute, Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research in Germany. Just a reminder yeah, while hi. we're getting Alexander's slides up, please use Slido to put questions in. All right, I hope you can hear me all fine. Uh, hi everyone, thanks Ted for the introduction. Um, so I was tasked with, um, oh, somehow my slides are moving. Not sure what is happening. Um, so I was tasked with how does the Southern Ocean mediate fluxes of heat, um, carbon between the continent, the ocean and the atmosphere. And the answer to this question might actually um, be quite simple um, that you say it's through the ocean circulation um, and mixing that the Southern Ocean plays such a cr crucial role. And this is mainly because in the Southern Ocean, uh, roughly, it's estimated that roughly about 80% of all deep waters return to the surface. And then they're circulated around the continent. And while doing this, they actually release um, CO2 and heat to the atmosphere in, a, in the first instance. And then um, as you go further north and these waters are modified, um, they take up anthropogenic heat and carbon. And it's estimated that it's about 13% of all anthropogenic CO2 emissions that go into the Southern Ocean and about 68% of the entire uh, excess heat. And if you put a number on this actually with, with current um, trade uh, values of, of, of carbon, um, this is uh, many trillions of dollars that we are talking about here. And um, through this process, the Southern Ocean slows down global warming um, substantially. And the other important process here is that um, it loses heat towards the continent. And we have heard a lot about this yesterday and also today. And that um, interacts, of course, with the melting ice around Antarctica and contributes to sea level. Um, so this seems to be a pretty um, clear picture. Um, but actually, if we look at this in detail, um, we have huge uncertainties in these fluxes. And when we build budgets, we are still sometimes debating the sign of the flux in certain regions. And, and that's a huge issue because if we really want to understand the future of climate change globally, we have to understand the Southern Ocean heat and carbon budgets. And most of the uncertainty, I would argue, lies here in this in this outgassing and, and heat release fluxes um, that are in the area um, south of the ACC and, and maybe not so much in the anthropogenic uptake. Um, so when we talk about these budgets, what I was saying, we have made huge advances in the last couple of years and decades, especially with, with the new capabilities that we have with the SOCOM biogeochemical Argo floats. And um, in this paper, here you can clearly see where we are or what is the range of fluxes we are talking about in terms of uncertainty. So depending on what product you're using, um, we are really here having a huge uncertainty and this will be fundamental to resolve this issue in the coming decades. 
And for this, Sarah already said that, that we really have, it's critical that we sustain the biogeochemical argo array in the first place, but also at the same time, um, um, sustain shipboard measurements to, to know um, what size of flux we are talking about and to do proper budgets. Um, we can only do by, by the combination of these um, data sets. We also have to really um, sustain the repeat hydrographic sections, and we also we have to reassess them actually. And for this, I, I strongly argue for international coordination um, that needs to be strengthened to get a better circumpolar understanding, especially in winter time. Um, also, the second point that I want to make is that we have to really close this gap that we have between observations and models. So we can really see here in the global carbon budget that there is a huge um, mismatch between the models and the data in the Southern Ocean. And we really have to um, strengthen the effort and prioritize data that helps us to um, improve models and parameterizations of those. And we also have to strengthen observations in so-called blind spots. and. Really, one of these blind spots is under the sea ice in winter. And this is really where this transformation happens between deep waters that come up the surface and are transformed to winter waters. And throughout this process, um, we get a ventilation of, of CO2 to the atmosphere. And we really have to focus on this um, processes involved in this ventilation process if we want to further understand this. Um, the second um, blind spot, so to say, is really the coastal region. And we also have heard about this a lot yesterday and um, have to understand how the heat is being transported from um, the open ocean to the coast and how the fresh water that's released from the Antarctic continent is leaving um, the coastal region. And, and for this, we have to get high quality data of, of salinity, but also of tracer observations such as isotopes or noble gases. and have to focus on those to better understand how the impact of melting ice in Antarctica affects the ocean circulation and therefore affects the freshwater budget and the carbon and heat budgets. So with this, um, I think I'm um, over my time already. So um, I'm happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So our, our next speaker is Amelia Shevnow. Amelia is an associate professor of geological oceanography at University of South Florida College of Marine Science. Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, thank you guys for inviting me. Um, I just really wanted to talk about and emphasize the importance of paleoceanography and paleo records in our sort of understanding of the evolution of Antarctica system and being able to put into context the observations that we are um, making today and to see if these observations suggest that the system is outside this span of natural variability or within. Um, and so much of what we know about Antarctica's cryosphere evolution through time is really inferred from the deep sea records. And so here is a record um, of oxygen isotopes in the deep sea from the Cretaceous all the way through to the present. And then these are the RCPs from um, ICP showing where we might go in the future. And what we can see is that we have a general cooling trend of 12 degrees over the last 65 million years, as well as periods of time where we have rapid ice growth at the Eocene Oligocene boundary, where we think we have the onset of East Antarctic ice, um, in the middle Miocene, where we might have the onset of West Antarctic ice, and then this period of time here more towards the present where we have both Northern hemisphere ice and Southern hemisphere ice. And we can't distinguish between these two. Um, and in the isotope record, and what we think drives these long-term climate trends are either um, and or changes in atmospheric CO2 or tectonic changes. But deep sea sediments really can't tell us 
where the ice grew and when, um, how the continental ice, how the continental shelf developed around Antarctica that enables the ice sheet to grow towards the ocean. We don't know much about past ice extent. We don't know much about past retreat rates unless we have these Southern Ocean ice proximal sediments that contain records of these past ice ocean interactions. Um, we are now able to generate ocean temperature records in the past that enable us to understand that temperature at the ice margin. We also are able to get sea ice extent and um, climate teleconnections. And one of the big things, this is a map of um, the ice or the sediment cores around Antarctica, as well as drill cores. And what we've really learned in the past um, couple of years is that East Antarctica is a lot more sensitive than um, we imagined in the past. And there's about 19.2 meters of sea level equivalent ice in these um, marine-based basins around East Antarctica. Um, so I wanna walk you through some successes that we've had um, in the long-term record. So this is um, a piston coring and geophysical survey record from um, offshore of Totten Glacier. And what we were able to do is really use these high resolution geophysical records to um, show us and tell us about ice sheet evolution. And we took piston cores and were able to primarily date those and tell us what we were seeing in the sediment record. What we need to do is we need to drill this area next to see how the ice has evolved through time. Um, we also have been able to do this on the continental shelf. Um, this is IADP Expedition 374, where we were able to generate an ocean temperature record um, through the Miocene climatic optimum, which is one of the warm periods of time where we expect that we're going in the future. And what we're able to see is that we actually have warming before ice expansion. And this is a record of um, the sediment showing that ice expansion over a warm period. And so the next steps there that we really need to synthesize records from the terrestrial to the deep sea to understand how ice sheets evolved in the Ross Sea area over the past um, 14 million years. We also have been able to reconstruct Holocene temperatures through time and really high resolution comparable to the ice core records. And this is a record of sea surface temperature from Palmer Deep um, that was one of the first um, sea surface temperature records around Antarctica. Um, we have many other ongoing records um, that we're preparing in the Holocene that give different um, perspectives on how different catchments evolve through time. Um, we can only do this from ships, and we have uh, several science priorities, um, including really understanding East Antarctica um, at the catchment scale, understanding past ice retreat rates, as well as being able to really date these records well. What do we need to do this? We actually need a ship to do everything that I've just proposed. To access East Antarctica, we need a longer expedition duration, we need heavy ice breaking, we really need to be able to hold station. Um, and we need to generate high resolution geophysical records, as well as some sort of geotechnical drilling capability. And what I wanna emphasize is to do this, we don't need a moon pool. We can do this over the side, or we can do this with the sub seafloor drilling system. Um, and we need space in the ship that, we can use to do shipboard core processing. And so to end, um, I really wanted to stress that we really need a paleoceanographic and paleoclimate component integrated into all of these large interdisciplinary programs, just like the IPCC did in this rendition, um, because we need to place the ongoing changes in temporal context. So thank you very much. I'm over my time. All right, thank you, Amelia. So our last speaker for this session is Sharon Stammerjohn. Um, Sharon's a senior research associate at the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Thank you. <laughs> so we're gonna zoom back to the present more or less, uh, the last 40 years to 100 years. 
Uh, this is fabulous, right, to have this array of talks <laughs> in one session. So I'm going to talk about Antarctic sea ice var variability, the long-term trends, long-term in quotes, and coastal exposure. What is most amazing right now, right now, is that we are now going into our seventh year of record low Antarctic sea ice. And there's been a shift, as you can see in this a uh, very beautiful figure by Alex Howman, and it's soon to be submitted, so hold on to your hats. But he's showing here that you have the monthly anomalies, and we've had this overall increase in sea ice extent up until about 2015 during the satellite era, and then suddenly we shifted to record low. What else is very remarkable about this transition is that we increased in anomaly persistence and variance, and we then shifted quite dramatically we don't know why we can point to atmospheric circulation anomalies uh, for certain, you know, events in the anomaly in the anomalies that appeared in 2016 going forward, but the persistence is what has us flummoxed, and it points to the ocean. We can put this into a longer-term perspective. Recently uh, um, available reconstruction. This is an observational-based reconstruction made by Ryan Folk and colleagues. Just came out recently. And this is pure gold for us in, uh, in the sea ice community because now we can see, you know, beyond this satellite record. And what's remarkable to me is what I see in this record is this underlying trend. It's kind of what the global climate models were suggesting. There's a lot of issues there, so a lot of uncertainty. This is a pretty robust observational based reconstruction. It's showing winter sea ice extent. And this now six to seven year period of record low sea ice is kind of in line with that long-term trend. So it kind of begs the question, what was happening during the, most of the satellite era that we've been trying to figure out? Well, we have a pretty good idea and a lot of that's the atmosphere, but I'm gonna show you first the spatial map just to contrast, because this actually highlights another really important thing that has changed. And so you're looking at ice season duration anomalies. That's for 2014 on the left. Blue means longer ice seasons. And in 2022, red means shorter ice seasons by up to three, four months. I mean, it's kind of remarkable anomalies. But they're also more or less circumpolarly wide distributed, which is very unusual over the satellite record. The satellite record normally shows very high seasonal and regional variability. And so again, this transition from going to record high to record low, and it being uh, persistent, it's also not just persistent in time, but it seems spatially persistent. So again, pointing to the ocean. We also have another new metric that just came out. This is uh, Phil Reed and Rob Massam looking at coastal exposure. And so this is a map showing the trends over the satellite error. Blue means longer exposure. And so here we have all of West Antarctica that's trending towards longer and longer exposures to wind and waves. And um, I could say that for the last year or two, we've also been at a low for fast ice and at a record high of coastal exposure everywhere, not just West Antarctica. So winds are the conspicuous drivers, right? And we've known this and it really imprints on the regional and seasonal variability. This is a map just showing correlations between winds and ice motion, also related to sea ice concentration changes. This, this, is, very, this is very obvious, it's very expected. We have the Southern Ocean that's exposed to the highest wind and waves on the planet. And yeah, we're gonna see very strong variability associated with the atmospheric circulation. But you know, what explains this transition that we've just experienced from record high to record low that's in line to the background you know, decreasing trend? It points to the ocean once more, but we don't know really what those ocean changes are. We can infer them, we can use our models and but we lack the data. And so we really need, especially, and this is just preaching to the choir, but we need the ocean observations within the sea ice zone on the continental shelf at the coast. Because those, it's the ocean that's driving the changes in sea ice production um, and, and thickness changes. And the other thing we don't know very much about are thickness changes. So we're still trying, we have experts in this room who are improving that metric derived from satellite data. It's challenging to measure that in the field. Our uh, ice mass balance buoys don't last very long. Um, so it's, it's definitely a challenge that we need to improve. And of course, the snow on sea ice is, is a problem. So overarching questions for the sea ice community, for the ice ocean atmosphere community, we're still trying to disentangle th thermodynamic from dynamical sea ice processes and the horizontal vertical fluxes of heat, fresh water, gases, nutrients. Alex just gave us a beautiful 
rundown of all the challenges and uh, gaps that we need to address there. And of course, there's the very strong ice ocean seasonal feedbacks too that could be playing into what we're seeing currently. So all of these priorities and near-term needs have all been said before, but again, we need those ocean observations in the CA zone during winter, especially on the shelves near the coast. We really need sustained observations actually in coastal areas, which are often very difficult to access because they're clogged with icebergs, thick sea ice. And yet that's, that's really a critical boundary and it's changing really fast. So we have a very coupled um, atmosphere ocean ice system. And in order to really properly study that and improve our models and improve our predictability, we actually really need more multi uh, platform multidisciplinary process studies. And so we're combining ships, satellite, autonomous observations together with data model synthesis. We're starting to do that. And it's it's remarkable. And, and just this gathering of the community, you know, is also headed in that direction. So the challenge, I'm not going to repeat these because we've all heard them, but if I could just take one more slide, I just want to emphasize that this coastal access is really important. And so this is a map of the MOAS showing the CA distributions. We were there, many of us in this room were there last Austral summer, and we were trying to get there <laughs> near the Thwaites, near the Eastern Amundsen, and we couldn't, and this was a record low summer sea ice year. It had all blown into this particular area. It clogged it, we couldn't get to it. The Koreans were there and they were able to actually access some ice shelf areas and deploy drilling rigs and also deploy XCTDs from helicopter into these critical zones that if we'd had that capability, we would have been tagging seals, would have been a remarkable time series over in the Eastern Amundsen, and we would have been deploying XCTDs, we would have been doing what we really needed to do. We gathered an amazing data set, so no problem with that, but I'm just saying that even in a record low CH year, we still need access to the coast. And the only way I know how to do that is with helicopters. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so we now have 10 minutes for questions that we'll read coming in from Slido. All right, uh, first question, um, and this is a general, does the existing ARV as envisioned contain the capabilities for making the shipborne oceanographic, or sorry, shipborne ocean geochemistry measurements as needed? Anyone want to jump in? Yes, sir. Or maybe Alex, if he's still on Zoom. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I mean, I, there is one thing I want to say to that. So I think um, we we are definitely capable of doing much more um, analysis from from shipboard measurements than than we are from from autonomous platforms so far. So we still need those for for geochemical analysis for sure. And but one thing we shouldn't forget, I mean, it's important to to get the access to the ice and have a strong ship that can break through the ice. It's it's no doubt. But we also have to consider that we are working in an environment where often the work we do is limited by the weather and the waves and sometimes we are not able to work while we are at sea because um, it's just not doable. And so we have to also have a ship that, you know, allows to deploy instruments in very rough conditions um, and uh, that keeps as stable as possible uh, also for people to do their work. Um, so this this is something that we have to consider, especially if we go into the winter season where where storms are much more frequent. That's something I wanted to add here as well. Thank you. Any other comments about that question? All right, next question. Um, this one is for Sharon. Um, it says, you touched on this, but the recent sea ice loss extends about as long as the sea ice growth of the 2000s. Any sense that we're just entering an era of larger magnitude decadal variations, or do you expect sea ice loss trend to continue? Can you hear me? It, yeah, it's, it's always on. <laughs> oh, it's always on. Would have been good to know, huh? <laughs> so stay tuned for Alex's paper, soon to be submitted, who's exploring that question. It is, it's the challenge. It's always been the challenge. There's such a uh, there's so much variability and, and the Antarctic sea ice is so sensitive to that variability. If you want one metric in the Southern Ocean that's gonna show you the greatest amount of variability, it's Antarctic sea ice because it's, it's highly sensitive to the atmospheric forcing and ocean forcing. 
So, and we know we have very strong teleconnections from the tropics and even the Northern hemisphere. So we have, we'd have, we know naturally we have a lot of decadal variability multi, and we have a lot of interannual variability with, and so um, we need really the ocean data and we need time series in order to uh, address that question. But I, I think, um, Alex is going to be making some progress with the analysis that he's going to present. And it's also going to highlight, you know, where the uncertainties are. So I don't have, Alex, you might want to chime in, but we don't, I don't know how we can say we, we don't know, <laughs> basically, but it definitely points to a stronger role of ocean forcing. Yeah, I, th I don't think we we can answer this question yet for sure, but of course it's a burning question we all want to know. Um, but yeah, it's it's just very difficult to to answer this, and and we have to have a longer time series and and better models to to be sure um, what is going on there. Great, thank you both. For Amelia, um, can you summarize the capabilities of the Joides resolution for working around coastal Antarctica as compared to the new ARV and its future timeline? Well, that's a question for the ages. Um, so the Joides resolution um, is, is an older ship and we are currently in a state where we may not have access to her. Um, but that is up in the air. Ultimately, though, she is not an ice strengthened. Well, she's ice strengthened, sort of. Um, but the captains are quite shy about bringing her into the ice at all. We were able to get into the Ross Sea Polynia um, with an escort from the Palmer that we didn't actually need because the ice was so low. Um, on the peninsula, she was able to drill um, in Palmer Deep with ice support as well. And the sea ice was not very heavy at all when that was drilled. Um, but that's not the case for the Amundsen Sea and Julia will probably talk about that. And so there's very limited access um, by the Joides resolution to any of the shelf regions. We can access the slope maybe, we can access the larger polynias. Um, but she really isn't the vessel to be drilling in the Antarctic. And, um, but we have proven that with simple high RPM and low weight on bit um, rotary coring that we have been able to recover really incredible sequences um, that we're able to look back through time and try to understand how the Antarctic ice sheet has evolved. So loaded question, she may not be around for very long, but we really need to get into these heavy ice coastal regions. Thank you. A uh, question for Ed in particular, which paleo-oceanographic records would you and the community like to see tie into ice core records? Are there certain places, certain times? Uh, well, it's a, a big loaded question. I think you maybe pick your favorite. Um, the thing that comes to mind when I'm listening to all these discussions here um, has to do with understanding carbon dioxide variations on sort of century to glacial interglacial timescales. And there, uh, it strikes me that it's not any one place that matters, but it's actually understanding sort of the four-dimensional carbon cycle of the Southern Ocean. So in the modern, we're still trying to figure out where carbon's coming in and out of the, the ocean. And the same problem exists um, on longer timescales. We see individual places where things change and they uh, you know, are compelling with respect to the dozen or so mechanisms that change atmospheric CO2, but we actually don't really know the, the budget, you know, the balance. So that's one, one take is, is we need comprehensive data. Um, and then, you know, you can run down the list. Uh, I think the, the coastal environments and changes in sea ice and, and understanding whether we really can trace sea ice from ice cores um, is quite important. Um, and my favorite at the moment is to understand the MPT and, and the, the sort of um, pre-MPT um, ice sheet, particularly in East Antarctica. Um, I think there's a lot of 
uncertainty about how sensitive that section is um, to warming. So, um, but I, I, obviously, if you ask other people, you'll get a, other answers. Thank you. Um, question for Sharon. What kinds of tools would we, would provide the sustained observations in the coastal environments? Is this a ship requirement or an autonomous measurement needed? It's both. <laughs> so yeah, we, we definitely need to improve the autonomous observational platforms for that for, for actually anywhere in, in the CIS covered Antarctic area because it's such a dynamic region. Um, so, and I think we're going in that direction as we've heard from others as well. Um, and I, but I, I think it really requires that collaboration between engineers and science, you know, so technology. So I'm really happy to, um, know about the new directorate at NSF, the technology innovation and partnership. And I think we need to learn how to use that, um, on the science side to improve that ability. But, um, I agree with wholeheartedly with my colleagues that you can have and improve autonomous observations, but you still need the ship based for calibration, for deployment, for retrievals, um, you know, for the process studies. It's really those process studies. I mean, we need the time series and we need to be able to distribute that spatially, but we need that, um, what I was describing, the multi-platform, multidisciplinary process study on board that's looking at that strongly coupled system. Thank you. And kind of a follow-up uh, or a related question. Um, is there more that we can do to leverage the autonomous platforms to monitor these regions? Are we getting the most out of, um, for example, under ice Argo or instrumented seals, et cetera? So again, to tag seals, you need a ship and you need to be able to get into those areas where you can find the seals. Um, uh, and that's that's a challenge, uh, but I do think, and we have experts here that the seal data is remarkable, and it's really provided those winter observations under the CIS cover that we don't have any other platform really. The Argos, those few that have been deployed within the seasonal CIS zone, didn't la they didn't stay under the seasonal CIS zone, so we need to figure that one out too. We can do bottom moorings, but um, if you really want upper ocean observations, you're you know you're now at risk of icebergs and and thick ice uh, dragging these along. Thank you. Um, question for Alex. Um, one of the needs you pointed to was better ocean salinity measurements. How do these requirements relate to the currently available salinity retrieval from retrievals from satellites? How much better accuracy and or spatial resolution is needed? Yeah, thanks for asking this. I think the, it's really important that we have very high quality salinity measurements in the Southern Ocean because it is um, what determines the stratification of the upper ocean. Um, and the, the, the gradients sometimes are small that we are looking at. And um, so we, we really need high accuracy salinity and um, also from the autonomous platforms um, that needs to be improved, certainly, I think. Um, and, and you are also pointing towards the satellite. And, and I think that there is also some potential there that we can learn on, on the larger scale variability also around the ice edge or maybe in Polynias from, from, from satellite data. And I think that's an, a very emerging topic that is um, still, um, I think, uh, progressing. But um, I think also satellite data in the marginal ice zone is becoming better and better. And um, I think that will be also in future a great tool to have. Thank you. We'll stop there with questions. Yeah, I think our time is up, but um, if we didn't get to your questions, those will be useful for the committee. So please do submit questions. Um, so that finishes this session. Thank you to all the speakers. We're going to move directly into session five, and that one is going to be moderated by Dan Costa. So the speakers for that session, please come to the stage. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, this is going to be a great session. We've had a series of talks providing the context for the biota. And so now we're going to look at how Southern Ocean high latitude biota uh, and ecosystems have evolved and how they respond to and contribute to systematic change. Our first speaker is Eileen Hoffman. Eileen is a professor and eminent scholar in the Department of Ocean 
and Earth Sciences and a member of the Center for Coastal Physical Oceanography, both at Old Dominion University. Eileen? Okay, thank you. Um, do I need to do something here to... <clears throat> okay, I'll wait. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> first off, I'd like to um, start by thanking the committee for the opportunity to be involved in this uh, workshop, and it's been interesting discussions for the last uh, day or so. All right, so what I was asked to talk about was Antarctic biota and ecosystems and where we might be in the future in terms of um, observing these systems and what the systems might actually look like. Um, so I'll start with uh, a reminder here about observations. And we've heard from many of the speakers and in various discussions that there are multiple observational platforms available to us now and ships are only one of many of these platforms. So we heard from Oscar yesterday that the ship capability should allow interfacing with other platforms and advancing science, and here I'm talking about in terms of ecosystems and, and other things as well, requires integration of all of these available observing technologies. All right, so we talk about food webs or uh, ecosystems in the Antarctic. The figure shown to the left here is the iconic Antarctic food web where everything flows to Antarctic krill and everything flows outwards from Antarctic krill. So this is the food web most people have in mind when they think about Antarctica, or Antarctic ecosystems and biota. The center panel here is an example of a food web from South Georgia, a sub-Antarctic area, the Scotia Sea. And the food web to the left here is the krill-dominated food web. But the one to the right is a non-krill dominated food web because at times South Georgia has a, has a, runs out of krill in effect because it's dependent upon inputs of krill from upstream sources like the West Antarctic Peninsula. The point here is that you can shift to a new food web. And in the case with South Georgia with the non-krill food web, that can sustain the system for a little while, but in the long term, it does not support all the top predator trophic levels that like the seals, the penguins, and, and the whales. And I bring this up because what we're seeing now in some areas outside of the sub-Antarctic or the uh, area and the uh, Scotia Sea is a transition to this non-krill dominated food web. The, the, the panel on the right here is from the uh, Ross Sea, and that's another type of food web where krill is not the dominant um, uh, mid-trophic consumer there, or mid-trophic level um, organism. There are various other organisms that come in there, and how we shift between those has lots of implications for the, for the, um, for the food web. So we have a lot of heterogeneity in the forcing and habitat structure. And we have a lot of regional differences. And that's another thing to think here about is it's, it's a different food web depending on where you are and the type of, and the season. All right, the other thing is um, Southern Ocean or Antarctic food webs are not isolated. They're, they're globally connected and they're connected at different kinds of trophic levels. Um, the seabird and cetacean migrations in and out of the Antarctic link the Antarctic food webs to those at much lower latitudes. So that we have a, so in the Antarctic, there are a lot of seasonal residents that are of the high latitudes, but also of the low latitudes. And Dan Costa and his colleagues recently uh, extended this idea by looking at the carbon and nitrogen transport that occurs through these seasonal migrations in and out of the Southern Ocean. There are also human interactions there um, that, that also give global connectivity, mainly through fisheries and tourism, that both of which have impacts on the food webs. And so the changes that go on in the Southern Ocean food webs have consequences outside of, of the Southern Ocean. And so what we want to do is to look at, at what these um, might actually be in, in the future because of looking at conservation and management of these systems. All right, so I was asked to, to look into the future and see what might that might hold for uh, Antarctic food webs. And the way, one way to look into the future is to use projections. And we're very fortunate in the Southern Ocean to have a number of high resolution regional and circumpolar coupled circulation sea ice 
ice shelf atmospheric models that can be used as input to food web models, biogeochemical models, and habitat models. And I've just shown you two examples here. The one on the right side is a circumpolar, high resolution circumpolar projection for temperature. And the one on the left is uh, a regional one from the Amundsen Sea. It's a circulation, but you see it, it resolves a lot of the mesoscale variability. So we're, we have these models, we have these tools. All right, so if we implement this, this is from a recent paper by Mike Deneman, um, looking at um, projections of sea ice concentration. And in the left panel here, the uppermost thing is the current condition of sea ice. The one to look at is for 2100. And it, you can look at that and see we have a huge reduction, projected reduction in sea ice. The center panel here is a projection of ice shelf basal melt. And this is done as a ratio of the uh, future 2100 to current. And this suggests that there is an increase in the basal melt rate of many of the ice shelves. And that's related to um, things we were talking about yesterday with warm deep water coming in onto the shelf. So in terms of the food web, that's what the right panel here shows. There's gonna be a large increase in dissolved iron. And Southern Ocean uh, ecosystems are limited. The primary production is limited by the availability of dissolved iron. And so the projections suggest that there's gonna be a lot of dissolved iron available to the surface waters in the future, all right? So that would suggest that there's gonna be an increase in production, all right? So if we look at an example from the Ross Sea, um, looking again at projections, and here you're looking from the Ross Sea out, ice shelf out into the Ross Sea. And the panel on the left is a projection for 2050. And the thing to look at here is the orange and red colors. All right. And this is a projection of mixed layer depth. All right. And so what this suggests is that mixed layer depths are going to get deeper. So there's more mixing, which allows more of the dissolved iron to come up into the surface waters. And by 2100, there's a lot more mixing with much deeper mixed layers. And these are for the summer period. So there'd be reduced uh, sea ice is what's allowing this to happen. There's more open water for longer time, which means a longer growing season and increased inputs of dissolved iron. So in this particular paper, they went ahead and looked at the primary production and there is an increase in primary production, but what changes is that there is a shift in the phytoplankton community composition to diatoms, and that has implications for the uh, input, inputs to the food web. All right, so this would suggest that maybe, you know, it's gonna be great, lots of primary production, lots of iron stimulating the production, but what we really wanna do is say, okay, what happens next? So the projections for the rest of the, for other components of the food web, and here I've only picked two, um, the, for Antarctic krill as an example, if we look at projections, the one on the uh, left side here is the projection of krill growth potential. And this was done using the, um, some of the RCP scenarios. And the thing to look at is the red line. And in the summer, that line is collapsed in up against the coast. All right, so these are areas that are, favorable for krill growth during the summer. The green areas are ones where krill do not do well growing during the summer. All right, the center panel here looks at projections of krill habitat based on the ability of the krill to complete its reproductive cycle. All right, and the important part here is to look at the orange areas relative to the green areas. So the habitat becomes much smaller to where krill can actually complete its reproductive cycle. And one of the strongest constraints you can put on an organism is the ability to either complete or not complete its reproductive cycle. All right, so if we look at a crab eater seal here from a recent paper by Louis Huckstadt, um, this is projections of uh, seal habitat along the West Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, in terms of where the seal gets, has the ability to forage, particularly during the time period when, um, when they're getting, you know, when they're pupping and that type of thing. But this is looking at the austral summer. And what this suggests is that there is a big habitat change 
and that the habitat that can support the crab eater seals is going to shift to higher latitudes. All right, so, so these would suggest that the other parts of the food web are going to have to move, and they may not be moving into areas with increased primary production. All right, the other thing I want to mention here is marine protected areas. The center panel shows the existing and proposed marine protected areas for the Southern Ocean. The one on the right here is the marine protected area that is now in existence for the Ross Sea. All right, these areas are becoming set aside and the Ross Sea one, which I think David Ainley will talk more about in his flash talk, are areas where we need to have monitoring and research. All right, the Ross Sea MPA is in existence for 35 years. At that point, it's gonna be evaluated to see if it's effective or not. The only way we're gonna know that is whether or not we do, whether it's is by monitoring and looking at that system. The uh, figure on the left here is from a workshop that Sharon Stammerjohn and others ran recently, looking at what is needed to monitor and evaluate the Ross CMPA. And the bottom pillar of this is observations, but also observations connected with process studies. So that's fundamental to understanding these areas and having access to these areas at all year round, or certainly at more than one, more than just the austral summer is important for that. All right, I would be remiss here if I don't briefly mention here the uh, UN Decade, the Southern Ocean Task Force. Um, there is a Southern Ocean Action Plan that was recently released about what the research needs are in the Southern Ocean. This is an international program. The Action Plan goes through many different things, but the one thing I wanna talk about here is what's highlighted in bold here is one of the recommendations from this is to have a coordinated international circumpolar sea ice study with a focus on seasonal and regional variability. The rationale behind this is that many nations are now having platforms, ships that can, and autonomous vehicles that can measure sea ice environments, but also as Sharon just pointed out in her talk, sea ice is changing. And what we know is that sea ice is gonna change a lot of things and marine ecosystems are one of the things that will change. All right, so to sort of end here, we have a complexity of responses here. Um, they're all shown here. There are a lot of interactions and these are going to, these stressors are gonna interact in like uh, warming and acidification are gonna interact in various ways to change our marine ecosystems. And we want to be able to measure, monitor that so that there can be some type of adaptation or mitigation. All right, so challenges, uh, observational capabilities. We know there's gonna be reduced sea ice or we think there will be reduced sea ice and increased open water. That puts more emphasis on coastal environments. And it also puts emphasis on higher latitudes as food webs shift. Um, we need to have inclusion of new data and technologies, the omics work, which I think Allison will talk about, as well as integration with remote, and, uh, remote sensing and, and autonomous measurements. But importantly for the science we have, we're going to need to think about neglected trophic links, because what's neglected now and we don't study may in fact become the major trophic pathway later. Also adaptation pathways. And I'll come back to the fact we're using projections to look at this. We need the observations to improve the projections. And this came up yesterday is that you couple the observations and models while at sea, run the model to help you guide your observations. So I'll stop at that point and say thank you and look forward to questions. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Eileen. Uh, we'll now have a Three minutes of questions uh, from Slido, if we have some. We don't have any in Slido yet. So if you have a question, please add it to Slido. They're too intent listening to the talk. <laughs> All right. oh, there's an in-person question. Can we get a mic um, over to Mo? Um, you mentioned in your talk that there's a shift in the primary producers to diatoms. Mm -hmm. If it's not diatoms, what is it? Like, what's the other option? 
Um, right now in the Ross Sea, a lot of it is in phaocystis, which is a, a type of um, phytoplankton that um, doesn't really, um, it, it's not easily grazed by a lot of the zooplankton. Yeah. And so potentially by shifting everything to diatoms, it would encourage something like an Antarctic krill to come in there and eat because Antarctic krill don't really eat phaocystis. So they're just like some kind of teeny tiny microplankton? I'm sorry, what? They're just like a microplankton? Like a what What kind of organism are, is a phaocystis? Is it bacteria? What is it? That that eats phaocystis? No, what is it? What is phaocystis? What kind of organism is it? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. It's, it's just... Maisie, no, it's Oh, what type is it's? It's a uh, Maisie, if I I'll let Tish answer. She's the expert. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I believe it's a Promesia fight, which is a different kind of protist. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and uh, a question from Slido. Yeah. Um. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um. Could you elaborate on? What key observations are needed to evaluate the effects of the Rossi Marine Protected Area Program? Whoa, um, we just had a whole workshop on that. Uh, <laughs> there's a workshop report that um, uh, elaborates on some of that, but I mean, uh, the physical environment for sure. Um, and then the, um, you know, just documenting or, or measuring food web components, um, yeah, that it's 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 basically looking at the food web and then how that food web is responding to things like um, not allowing fishing vessels to come in. You know, does that if you know what's the impact of that on hierotrophic levels? And I think David Ainley might mention some of that in in his presentation. Thank you, Ted. in the future. I assume from basal melting. In that model, do we know whether or not they got a covariant iron content in the ice that's being melted around the planet? No, that that the that is not in the model. What has been used is a average in member concentration for the ice uh, for the dissolved iron that's in the melted ice. But that is a very good point, and that's something that could be incorporated at some future time if the information is available to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should say we could change those projections by changing those kinds of numbers. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And one kind of also a question related to um, iron. Uh, how good are the predictions of future iron flux to the surface ocean and what might be needed to improve those? Yeah, okay. So the predictions of the flux to the surface ocean are based upon the circulation models and also the, the circulation underneath the ice cavity. So if there are observations that improve how we can parameterize and um, simulate those processes, that would improve the projections for the amount of dissolved iron that will be delivered to the surface waters in the coastal environment. Okay, we're gonna move on now. We're gonna start our flash talks. We'll hold the questions until the end of all the flash talks. Our first uh, flash talk will be given by Allison Murray. Allison is a molecular microbi microbial ecologist and biological oceanographer at the Desert Research Institute in Nevada. Allison. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank the National Academy and the committee for um, inviting me to share a few thoughts on future research directions in biological adaptation and evolution of life in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. Uh, and I need to start this off with an acknowledgement that uh, these ideas come from a workshop that uh, we had down in October that NSF uh, sponsored. And so I really want to thank the participants to that workshop. There were about 60 that were there. Um, it was all virtual. And uh, the organizing committee who's been working with me um, to sort of uh, synthesize the data since then. The 
um, if, if I think that there's consensus uh, that if we have to distill things down to one driving question um, regarding life in Antarctica, I think is what is the resilience of Antarctic life scaling from viruses to whales to changes brought on by climate change? Uh, there are some example types of questions in this area of research are uh, how are Antarctic population genomes structured over space and time? Um, this tells you about um, how diverse the populations are and how diverse they are can tell you how resilient they are. The more diverse ones tend to be more resilient. Um, how fast can Antarctic genomes change? Something that we really don't know. Um, how competitive are Antarctic organisms to invasions in terms of predation, uh, competition for resources, space, and disease resistance? And how sensitive are Antarctic organisms and ecosystems to human-driven pressures, such as fishing, tourism, our human presence in Antarctica? Uh, this requires collections of diverse species, many members of each, experimental research, ecosystem studies across the Antarctic and Southern Ocean environments by a diverse population of polar researchers. Each species may respond differently to environmental pressures, and each may adapt, evolve, and respond differently to changes in climate. Uh, as you may or may not know, DNA encodes genes. These are the words that encode the functions of the proteins. These are like molecular machines, and selection happens at the level of these molecular machines. And those changes, though, are recorded in the genomes. Antarctica, I have uh, not a lot of time to talk about diversity, but the, the diversity of life in Antarctica is immense. It is, uh, especially in the marine ecosystems, it approaches that of what we find in lower latitude ecosystems, but we know a lot less about the life histories of these animals um, and their evolution, how, how they've adapted to the Antarctic. Uh, genomic, genome sciences, comparative genomics are really starting to shed light on the molecular basis of biological adaptation and response. And uh, although there are um, uh, maybe 17,000 uh, invertebrate organisms that live in the benthos of Antarctica. We, um, in the center of an unaccounted for number of uh, microbes and single celled eukaryotes, uh, we're beginning to know something about um, certain areas of, uh, based on genomics in this area. Um, Antarctic, the fish community has sequenced now 44 fish genomes of the notothenoids, which are a very interesting population of fish that really expanded and radiated, are very successful in Antarctica. And through their genome sequencing, we've learned about genome expansions that have then, um, uh, where antifreeze proteins are present in multiple copies. Um, proteins, membranes, and metabolic adaptations are all found and identified through these comparative genomic studies. Um, a lot of the uh, enzymes can be, have very small numbers of changes in them to make them cold adapted. So in the figure in the lower um, panel, um, structural adapt adaptations for just three amino acids have enabled this protein, adenylate kinase, to be really flexible and pr still perform at low temperature. Uh, there are about eight Antarctic algae genomes that have been sequenced, and uh, this uh, sort of early stages of research has shown that there's hundreds of duplicated genes. They have ice binding proteins, and they have restructured photosynthetic apparatus. In some cases, a num number of genes have been duplicated uh, for light harvesting pigments. There are numerous cold adaptive features in bacteria. Um, this uh, diagram shows some of them. Uh, there are many more bacterial genomes that have been sequenced. They're very, they're sort of small on the order of sort of three to five million bases. Um, and they're pretty e easily accessible through either sequencing of isolates or sequencing of metagenomes. But they have cold chalk proteins. They also have ice binding proteins and many adaptations to their membranes to allow them to function in the cold. Uh, the vision for Antarctic omics science in the 2030s, and omics is sort of the combination of genome sciences, transcriptome sequencing, proteome sequencing, metabolite sequencing, or metabolite chemistry. Um, in order for uh, what where our vision is, is that we think that there's going to be hundreds of uh, genomes for eukaryotes, thousands of genomes for fungi and algae, uh, and other produce, tens of, tens of thousands of genomes for bacteria, archaea, viruses. Um, this needs to be linked together with an interoperable cyber infrastructure system that does not exist currently. 
um, and to study the behavior and adaptation of these um, organisms, we can use transcriptomes and other types of omics to really look at the, the functions of their adaptive responses. Uh, it, an important point here is the integrated understanding of ecological and evolutionary interactions between trophic levels, functional networks, and ecosystem function are needed to develop this comprehensive vision of what is happening in Antarctic organisms and ecosystems. Uh, with this information, in order to access it, um, ARV-enabled access is critical, and so, so many of the points that have already been brought up and getting to different ecosystems also include the hydrothermal vents and cold seeps um, and really understanding the gradient of coastal to polar frontal uh, zone oceanography are important climate a lot of people in the community are really interested in doing um, in order to study adaptation doing onboard experiments is critical so having the facilities on the ship to facilitate uh, experiments is important having an enhanced presence to seasonal access year-round access key, um, making and incorporating omics into informing Antarctic MPA research like what Eileen introduced is, is, is going to be important, um, and, and really integrating ecosystems research tying together trophic levels, physiology, omics, and foreign science. And I think that in a lot of the platforms that were described yesterday, for solid earth and for sea level st rise studies, um, we you can also incorporate uh, life scientists on your cruises to help and take advantage of the types of ecosystems that you're working in and, and access, especially to the benthos. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Allison. Uh, again, we're just gonna move right on and hold questions for the end. Our next speaker is David Ainley. David's a senior avian ecologist at H.T. Harvey and Associates in Las Gatos, California. David? Hello. Oh, there he is. Um, we can hear you now, David. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, I'm really honored that I was invited to talk about <clears throat> this sort of thing. Um, question I was assigned is interesting. Um, very most of the talks we've heard so far are, have been confined, confined to climate change. Um, however, you know, recent work in the Southern Ross Sea has shown that, yes, indeed, climate change is important, especially wind-driven factors, but also the food web is changing, and it likely has to do with fishing. And it's showing um, that so-called indicator species, such as penguins and seals, uh, their populations have been growing in the last couple of decades. Okay, next slide. Um, so these trends, along with uh, studies of the benthic biota in the Southern Ross Sea, represent the longest biological time series in the Southern Ocean, beginning in the 1960s. This is an incredible um, archive of, uh, of data um, from which uh, the present and the future um, can be based. Um, the trends in the Southern Ross Sea should not be dismissed as anomalous. The Southern Ross Sea represents the high latitude um, Antarctic. Um, um, yeah, okay, so these penguins and seals um, have been designated by Camelar as so called indicator species the purpose of managing the recently designated Ross Sea Region Marine Protected Area that Eileen mentioned. Ross Sea, and particularly McMurdo Sound, is the most intensively researched stretch of the Southern Ocean. Um, there are many published, hundreds of published studies have been um, produced, and such as biogeochemistry of Ross Sea by uh, Dunbar and DiTullio, and um, Linea's Windows to the World by Smith and um, Barber. Um, this is an incredible archive of information. Um, the Rossi Region MPA was initiated by U.S. scientists, and it never would have happened if it hadn't gone all the way to the U.S. State Department. 
um, designation of this area is a huge deal. And the US has an obligation to be leading the research and monitoring um, that is required by designating document. As Eileen mentioned, the MPA is up for renewal and, and not far in the future. Okay, next. Please. Slide. Oh, so here is the Ross Sea um, Region MPA. The really nitty gritty is, uh, is confined to the waters overlying the shelf and slope. All that stuff to the north was added for bio biopolitical reasons. Um, but it is the shelf and the slope in which this incredible archive of information is available. And as I said, um, it, Rossi is not wanting for so-called indicator species. Okay, next slide. Uh huh. So, in my hum humble opinion, and I do think I'm speaking, and I know I'm speaking for dozens of scientists. Um, the U.S. marine research over the next few decades needs to re include a respectable leading effort in the Rossi region, and especially in McMurdo Sound. Um, next, please. Um, not only that, um, well, you know, the U.S. will be contributing all kinds of satellite imagery and automatic weather station data um, to mon monitor the biophysical factors, you know, the U.S. has been doing this and will continue to do this. However, we have this problem of the indicator species. Um, and they are showing that the ecosystem is changing. But th the question is, you know, what is going on? Um, OK, next, I think. Um, so in McMurdo Sound, the annual cover of Fast Ice provides an incredible research platform, which um, human divers, ROVs, ice fishing, moorings, tagging of animals, time depth, you know, bio logging of animals, you know, has been deployed since the 1960s, um, along with the aerial surveys and that sort of thing. And as I said, resulting knowledge is amazing. Um, and so, you know, in a way, there's been a non official LTR, but now there's a need to be, you know, integrating the various components of um, what has been monitored for these decades. The okay, next. Okay, here we go. Mon um, McMurdo Sound, um, covered with fast ice, um, but also there's a, the McMurdo Sound Polinia. Thus, the, the southern, southwestern Ross Sea and McMurdo Sound represents a microcosm of the high latitude coastal Antarctic Ocean. Um, and that, I've tried to say it's full of uh, indicator species um, that have been intensively studied, um, but now their, their interrelations need to be um, linked. Okay, next. Okay, so you saw those food web models that Eileen Hoffman revealed. Well, in the Southern Ross Sea, the, the predators and the fish haven't read, the, read these papers. Um, in the, the, the very tightly tight food web, I should say that most of the, a lot of the phytoplankton goes ungrazed because of the foraging by these, all these predators. Um, so whether or not future increase in productivity is gonna have any effect, it really remains a huge question. Okay, within the food web, we have, um, which is where silverfish are an important component, we have these species competing with one another for silverfish, but they're also eating one another. So it's an incredible um, food web for sure, with the you know, arrows going up and back. Um, okay, next, next. Okay. David, we're gonna need you to wrap up, please. Okay, so we're, everyone talking about international collaboration, but we do need an, an intranational research effort to be integrated. Um, not just NSF, but also the U.S. Coast Guard, National Marine Fisheries Service, and other agencies. Um, and so, you know, anyway, that's what I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, David. Okay, again, we'll move right on and save the questions for the end. Our, our uh, final speaker is Patricia Yeager. Patricia is a professor at the University of Georgia, okay. Department of Marine Science. 
Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really honored to be invited and thank you to the organizers. Um, I am supposed to speak on the uh, ecosystems, but focusing primarily on the biogeochemistry. Um, so I'm gonna focus on some key questions that have been around for a while is what is the role of Antarctic coastal and near shore regions? We heard a little bit about the open ocean earlier today. What is the role of these regions on the total carbon uptake by the Southern Ocean now and in the future? And we've known for a while that coastal polynias are carbon sinks because of their very high productivity associated with the marginal ice zone. Um, the Amundsen, oops. The Amundsen is the place I've been and we've shown um, that its rate of uptake is about 10 times per meter squared on average than the greater Southern Ocean. So these are hot spots. I like to say they're small but mighty. Um, we've also seen from other investigators that the Ross Sea Polynya and the Mertz Polynya and the Gerlach Strait are similarly potent, if not even more so in certain areas. So this is a really, really important system. And the key is that they're climate sensitive because they're very tightly coupled to the sea ice issues that Sharon Stammerjohn spoke about earlier today. And again, it's because of the, they're really driven. This is a glider data from uh, Oscar sort of showing where the high chlorophyll is in, in that warm, uh, fresher layer that forms when the sea ice melts. So there's this sweet spot where mm -hmm. the nutrients and the iron are coming from below, but the water column is stable because there is sea ice melt. And so that's a really important piece of this puzzle. And, and part of the story about whether more iron is gonna make this system more productive is very much related to whether or not there's still gonna be some stability left provided by the sea ice. Um, we do know that when the sea ice starts to go away, we can see the flux, the carbon flux of these regions is responsive to the loss of sea ice. Thankfully, the LTR time series data have proven that uh, these fluxes are sensitive to ecosystem change. In this case, uh, you see an increase in the CO2 uptake by this region as uh, the sea ice is still present, but has increased in, in area and um, the blooms are responding. So what else might it be sensitive to? You've probably seen this figure. Um, maybe you though haven't noticed that there's a plankton bloom offshore. Um, and so we've been studying how in the Amundsen Sea, this very productive algal bloom is linked to the uh, offshore, uh, not the offshore, the, the buoyant melt plume from the melting ice shelf, the basal melt that was just described. And you can see here a, a sort of a plume of iron rich water coming out from the Dotson ice shelf from uh, measurements made in 2010 and 11. Uh, you've also seen uh, Kevin Arrigo showing that these chlorophyll concentrations across all 45 polynyas in the Antarctic are related sort of to the basal melt rate. There's a correlation of about 0.6, which is pretty good. Um, however, if you actually look from year to year, these regions are very highly variable, as are the Plinias. So if you look at the dots and meltwater flux against the almonds and sea primary productivity, they don't match. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not going to be easy to say more basal melt, more productivity. Uh, the variable meltwater does not explain these variations. So we've been exploring quite a bit how this actually works um, and looking at how combination of sea ice, glacial melt, coastal ice scape changes will be influencing both the iron and carbon supply to the coastal Antarctic ecosystem. And just to give you a little bit of a preview, there's iron rich circumpolar deep water. So in addition to our intuition about, oh, there's iron in the glacier, actually, if, you, if you're looking at the model, most of the iron that's being brought into these ecosystems is coming from the deep water, the circumpolar deep water that is being meltwater modified and made oops, made more buoyant and coming up to the surface. That's a really key piece of the puzzle. It's not just the melting glacier, but in fact, it's the, the ocean circulation, which is delivering the iron to the surface. It's also picking up a lot of iron as it moves onto the shelf, we think. Um, and then it comes slamming out of the uh, ice shelf um, in places like the Dotson outflow and entering the Plinia um, through various mechanisms. And then we also realized that there's a really strong coastal current, of course, as you saw in, in Mike Denman's model that carries stuff from upstream, from glaciers melting upstream, and then carries some of that iron downstream. So it's a pretty complicated system and very tightly coupled to the physics. And you can't just measure the dissolved iron. You have to also measure the organic compounds that might hold the iron and make them bioavailable. You have to look at particulate iron. 
in addition to the CO2 and microbial communities that are really key to the cycling of this iron and how bioavailable it is. It's not just total iron, but what is the form of that iron making it available to the phytoplankton? So we need to look at how the iron is coming up off the sediments um, and how it's being modified in the cavity. And so tracing what's happening inside the cavity turns out is probably really important, including potential subglacial meltwater contributions coming up from underneath the, um, the glacier. So, and then finally, how do you how do you get that iron from that outflow out? out into the euphotic zone. So there's all the mesoscale processes that you need to understand and the speciation question that I mentioned. And I am dropping, running out of time. So I'll just show you this. We're interested in the coastal ice scape because it's changing dramatically. This is a shot we took this past year of the Western Dotson ice shelf, where the outflow is coming out and comparing that to the inflow, the Eastern side where the inflow is. And I guess you can probably see the caves and the, and the erosion and the slumping of this area where that warm water is coming out. And that's affecting not just the ice shelf itself, of course, but also the ice scape around that area. So what does the future hold in order to make any predictions about this? We must um, work with models, as has been mentioned many times, but we really wanna know how this productivity and carbon uptake will change with increasing sea ice and sea ice melt, because we may be adding iron, as I said, but if we're also losing sea ice, we're gonna lose that mixed layer depth effect. And then I mentioned the subglacial meltwater. So again, working with models, very tightly, um, tightly relationships between the ship and the modelers. Um, this model was built, Pierre Saint Laurent, with really well, well validated model data from uh, 2010-11, and it's in the process of being improved with ship data from 2022. But the main thing, oops, I guess I really want to say is, um, well, I'll show you that. I'm not going to show you that model right now. The issue I think I really want to point out is that the, the, the work we did at sea was very tightly coupled to model. And the model guided what we did. And then we did a lot. And uh, I think we were the, the example that you saw earlier from um, Tim yesterday. But... We had two sets of CTDs, we had underway towfish, we had continuous underway sensors on the ship, we had gliders of various sorts, we had eight, well, six gliders and two AUVs. Uh, the AUVs went under the ice to get samples for us, which was extraordinary. And then we also, strikingly for the first time, had a trace metal team working next door to a sediment coring team. And we figured out how to do that in a way that, that really worked. And so what we're talking about is a huge amount of work, um, a lot of talented people, a lot of really good gear. Um, many of these things, someone asked about the trace metal system on the ARV. It looks like it's about the same from what I can tell. And I was gonna check with Amy, but it looks like it's a similar design to what we do on the Palmer, which is to have the starboard A-frame put the second CTD over the side. So it looks very similar. Um, I also want to emphasize how important it is for the whole group to have support from satellites. Um, both ocean color and sea ice are critical to our understanding when we're in the ship offshore. And so bandwidth, of course, and getting that information to the ship is key. And then in, in my remaining minute, um, I guess I've lost my remaining minute, but let me just say one other thing that I think is really important and nobody has mentioned. When you put this many people on a ship and there were 63 people on the boat for more than 60 days, um, there's a lot of stress and a lot of uh, challenges. I'm not sure we need longer ship time. More, I, I could see you say we could use probably a few more scientists. Um, I do appreciate the increased number of science births, but I don't think we need more than 60 ship days. Um, we do need 24 seven operations. So we need a team of logistics on the ship that can handle a really, really busy day-to-day uh, -day process. But we also need, because these teams are interdisciplinary, they're usually international. We come from different science approaches. We need a lot more emphasis on what I think Google has figured out with Aristotle is that a good team needs help. We need to learn how to function as a team. And so we need more pre-cruise team building. We need more interaction ahead of time between the ships and the logistics people on board and the science. And we need a safe space. The number one predictor of success for Google's Aristotle team study was psychological safety. And so we have to make these ship spaces that are going out for so long 
safe for the people on board. And that's going to take some work before you put them on the boat. And I will end with that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, that finishes our presentations. We're now going to go into the question period. And we'll do a few questions. Do a few questions. Yeah, we'll do a few questions. All right, we'll just make lunch a little bit shorter. Um, just a couple questions. Um, let's see. First, um, uh, relating to um, the Marine Protected Area in the Ross Sea, what metrics will be used to determine success? And anyone can feel free to jump in. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Um, about the Marine Protected Area in the Ross Sea, what metrics will be used to determine success? Is it here? Is this on here? Yeah, okay. Um, I think the metrics that determine success are still being <clears throat> still being discussed. Yeah. And and that's um, I think one of the things that um, came out of the workshop that was held um, that Sharon and other people convened was was um, we're we're not sure yet what the metrics will be, and I, I Sharon might want to add something to that, but and to me that's somewhat distressing that the MPA is established and it's there and we still don't have a plan for how we're gonna monitor it and assess its effectiveness. And um, anyway, other people might wanna say something. Uh, the is um, I could say something. Um, I tried to make the case for McMurdo Sound. Um, it's a microcosm of a coastal high latitude Antarctic. Um, Logistical capabilities there are incredible. Helicopters, um, track vehicles, snowmobile mach machines, and that sort of thing, um, as well as remote sensing from satellites. Um, and, and, and so we, you know, we have this incredible backlog of information of these time series of both the benthos and the water column processes. Um, so really the the MPA was established to so to uh, quote unquote um, protect the structure and function of the Rossi ecosystem. Well, I don't know that the Rossi ecosystem structure and function has actually been described, um, but I think by integrating um, these long time series um, with with uh, inter interdisciplinary work, or at least to continue that sort of thing, I think. Um, will go a long way towards um, seeing you know, how the so-called structure and function of the Rossi ecosystem has changed. Um, you know, if we disperse all their effort way up, you know, far afield, um, really we're, and, and with snapshot sorts of studies, it, it really won't work. Um, but we do have the, but it is, we do have the capability of, integrating um, some incredible efforts. Um, and I, I would hope that that um, should be encouraged. Great, thanks. Um, Sharon, you wanna make a quick comment? Okay, one other question. Um, Allison, what is holding Omex back? Is it just access to the coast? Or, sorry, is it just access or is it the cost of sequencing so many samples? Uh, this question is for Allison. What is holding Omics back? What is, I'm oh, sorry, is it just access or is it the cost of the sequ of sequencing the samples? I, I, it's probably a little bit of both. Um, I think if you ask the community that access is the biggest problem, uh, the cost of sequencing has dramatically changed in the last seven years. Um, so that sequencing genomes and doing high quality, the, the challenging, you know, microbial genomes are pretty accessible to sequence, but now sequencing genomes of eukaryotes with all of these chromosomes and uh, rich character and, you know, really a lot larger scale, the, the order of magnitude of sequencing 
you know, eukaryotic genomes scales from somewhere between 10 to 100 to 1,000 times as big as a microbial genome. So the technology for doing this and assembling high quality reference genomes exists now, and they're doing it. And uh, you may have heard of the Earth Biogenome Project, but this is a very ambitious effort to sequence representative species of all life on Earth. And uh, so through this, this group and workshop, one of the things that uh, we're interested in doing is being an Antarctic node for that project. And um, they're pretty eager to have us uh, participate. So I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, and this question is for all. The, and this will be our, our last question. Um, other questions that were entered on Slido, we will ask the speakers to address separately or um, our committee will get back to the askers. Um, so the question, the Southern Ross Sea McMurdo Sound seafloor is likely to have hydrothermal vents and methane seeps. From the biological perspective, what is the level of importance for exploration of these areas? They might provide a lot of iron to the bottom water for sure. So I'd be really interested to know how extensive they are and what their fluxes are for sure. Not to mention the ecosystem aspects, of course. And understanding how these systems function in in the high latitude and in the cold waters and the types of life that live there and exploring them, I think is super important. All right, well, thank you very much. That uh, concludes our session. We have a short break for lunch. It's in the great room. And please return here at 12.15 for uh, our afternoon session. Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. My name is Jill McCookie and I will be moderating this next session. Our last session today is focused on what changes in erosion and hydrology are expected with shifting ice sheets and how this will affect biogeochemical cycles, biota, and potential hazards. Our first speaker is Sydney Hemming. Sydney is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. Thank you, Sydney. I'm actually a professor, and that's a, a good indication of my not having weighed in quickly enough with my bio. <laughs> Um, anyway, I really appreciate being here. Uh, it's been really exciting to see all the other talks. And I have to say that what my group and I will be doing is piling on with some of the very similar stuff that's been already said. Um, I'd like to start with uh, an overview uh, of the of sort of what's known about the Antarctic uh, continent, even though it's been said a number of times already, because our task is an overview on changes due to altered erosion and sedimentation. So this is a set of figures from a a Pollard et al. paper, um, and the top map is a uh, it shows the, the the extent of floating ice shelves in in blue, and the and the range of places where the ice uh, the grounding line retreated um, to that spot within five thousand years in the modeling uh, simulations. The bottom left figure is the um, modern bedrock elevations below sea level around Antarctica, and the right hand bottom is the modern ice thicknesses above uh, above flotation. And um, it's been said a number of times, but the East Antarctic ice sheet um, has a, a, holds approximately 52 meters of sea level, something on the order of 18 meters of those that are in this vulnerable place with um, ice floating, um, uh, uh, ice margins below sea level. Um, uh, the ice thickness is approximately three or four kilometers, and it's mostly grounded above sea level, but with these vulnerable spots in Wilkes and Adelie land. And in contrast, the West Antarctic ice sheet holds about five meters of sea level, um, the ice is about one or two kilometers thick on average, and it's mostly grounded below sea level. So in addition to this sort of uh, look at Antarctica and the, and the situation of the ice on the continents, we also have already been shown uh, this, this famous uh, figure from Zakos et al. Um, of the Cenozoic climate uh, history based on, this is a shout out to scientific ocean drilling, this type of graph would not be possible without scientific ocean drilling. And this, in this um, figure, um, uh, Zako said I'll uh, compile the uh, benthic delta O18 values um, to look at the, at the sort of global integrated climate history. Um, and notably, um, at about the Eocene-Oligocene boundary, there's a, a sharp increase in the delta O18 decrease in temperature. 
but sufficient that it couldn't have been just explained by changes in temperature and there must be ice volume changes. And this information is largely consistent with the much more sparse data uh, close to Antarctica on the changes in clay mineralogy and ice rafted uh, detritus, and um, also sparse studies on the continent uh, indicating about that time for the initiation of Antarctic glaciation. So one of the big questions we have to ask ourselves is how to assess the vulnerability of Antarctica's ice. And this map is a compilation from Brendan Riley of the cores that are available at the Oregon State Antarctic uh, Core Collection. Uh, the, the bigger of the base uh, co uh, spots are cores, cores that are greater than three uh, meters. And the bright red spots are, co are cores that are taken that are greater than three meters from the Palmer and Gould uh, vessels. And then the, um, the drill cores from the drill cores from Andrill and shall drill are shown that don't show up so well because they're in a mass. They're shown in the uh, uh, orange squares. And then importantly, DSDP, IODP, um, ODP, IODP cores are shown as the yellow squares with red uh, spots around them. I'm going to be showing a couple of examples. Oops, sorry. I'm going to be showing a couple of examples from um, some of the IODP site around uh, Fritz Bay and uh, Wilkes Land. Okay, so the first example I'm going to show is from this interval in the Pliocene where we went from relatively warm early Pliocene conditions to more uh, cooler and more variable uh, late Pliocene conditions. And the, this study is from site 1165 from off the Pritz Bay margin. And the map on the top right is a map of, is a survey of the Hornblende 4039 ages around Antarctica with the color scheme. Uh, legend here, <laughs> pointing to the screen, legend here on the on the uh, bottom right showing uh, younger ages in, in uh, pinks, sort of the typical Ross Pan-African age in orange and red, and then older ages in the green, turquoise, and blue colors. And so you can see that there's a pattern of variability around Antarctica that uh, allows us to have breadcrumbs for tracking icebergs. And the bottom right figure is a map uh, a, a model figure for, of the iceberg trajectories around Antarctica. The icebergs uh, typically move counterclockwise with the with the countercurrent around Antarctica, and they basically spin out into the Antarctic circumpolar current uh, most dramatically in the embayment areas. And then on the on the left hand side is the data from uh, the Cook et al. paper from 1165. The the uh, the pie charts on the left. Uh, represent the distribution of hornblende grained ages within these samples. And, uh, and this is synthesized in this middle figure. The orange is the uh, approximate modern distribution of hornblende ages. And the graph shows the variation in proportions of uh, Wilkes Land versus Pritz Bay, local distant versus uh, close uh, ice rafted detritus. And so you can see that, um, at, that during the uh, uh, warm early Pliocene, that the distribution of provenance ages is very similar to today, but during the cooler and late and variable late Pliocene, the uh, the distribution of, of uh, far traveled IRD from uh, Wilkes Land becomes much more important. So process matters, and the observations matter, and this plus other provenance stories, and also uh, far field evidence from from uh, sea level caused the. Uh, uh, ice sheet modelers to go back and think about what processes might have been left out that caused them to not be able to predict the level of change in the ice margin that was required to, to explain the, the uh, geological observations. And so they, um, they uh, added to their model uh, mechanisms to account for uh, ice cliff failure and hydro fracture. Um, so the, the top, oh, sorry, the, the uh, the top left is the original model. Uh, B and C are with cliff failure and hydro fracture um, built in sort of uh, uh, to their model. And then uh, D is with both of those mechanisms uh, included in the model. And, and that's not the only thing. In, in addition to uh, in including those kinds of ice margin effects, um, Jackie Osterman uh, did a study to look at the effect of dynamic topography and the Wilkes Land margin was about 100 meters um, lower in the Pliocene compared to today. And if the reconstructions take into account those uh, new mechanisms plus 
the dynamic topography, even more retreat on that Wilkes land margin um, can be explained. Okay, so my group's goal is to try to pile on to the uh, growing um, uh, 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 the growing request to be able to examine the system from right next to the ice to the deep ocean. So we want to be able to go in and we want to look at the processes that are going on at and near the grounding line and beneath the shelf. We want to be able to look at both the um, um, geophysical imaging of the surface and the architecture of the sediment uh, pile underneath the, of the ice shelf as well as out into the deep ocean. And to borrow from Mo Walzak, we need to take mud in order to be able to connect the modern observations and processes to the proxy evidence that we can gain from the uh, ancient record. So one of the things that I think is kind of an exciting new development for International Ocean uh, Discovery Program is adding X-ray capabilities onto the ship. So I think uh, um, Expedition 379 was the first one that sailed uh, X-rays on the ship, and now they built a better system. And these pictures that I'm showing are from um, some uh, data, that, some images that Trevor Williams collected on the new instrument in at IODP in uh, College Station. Um, on the left is a picture and then an X-ray of a core from the Amundsen Sea. And you can see the, the sort of density change with the uh, lithology, but you can also see the black spots that represent the ice rafted detritus. Um, the image to, in the middle is from a, a site off of uh, Wilkes Land. I'm actually gonna show some data from that in a second. And then the, um, the image on the right is a, a, a laminated section from the low, late Pliocene, early Pleistocene from the, from the Ross Sea margin where you can see ice rafted detritus distributed um, through there. So the example that I'm going to show you from the Wilkes Land margin, um, uh, site 1361, this is from a, a paper from Wilson et al. in 2018, and it follows a study of uh, Cook et al. looking at the late Pliocene that I'll show in a moment. Uh, Cook et al. as part of her, of her study uh, looked at the um, known distribution of geological um, terrains around the vicinity of, of Wilkes Land, and the red lines here are showing the sort of approximate sea level changes as a result of, of the ice moving in to these various places. And so by this survey of looking at the geology and looking at the um, ice dope geochemistry from those terrains, this is uh, neodymium isotopes against strontium isotopes. The samples that, that Keras measured from the, uh, from the interglacial times are shown here in the open symbols and the more glacial times are shown here in the closed uh, symbols. So you can see there's a significant uh, change in the provenance. And then this follow-up study from Wilson et other, this is the neodymium isotopes in the red curve here. Um, and, you can, and this is the barium to aluminum as an indicator of a, a productivity below it. And for reference, here's the sea level and surface and subsurface uh, temperatures from other uh, coring sites, as well as this uh, uh, temperature from the um, Antarctic ice core. And you can see that every one of these times where um, Antarctica is warm, we get these um, uh, significant differences in the provenance um, from these sediments. Um, one provenance tool, <laughs> and there's and there's not a, a huge amount of these kinds of data available. But this, these are other two two uh, studies from around this region. This is the Pliocene study that originated this work from uh, Cook et al. And then here's a from a nearby core. Uh, 1356 is a neodymium record from the middle Miocene climate transition. Here's the core top from that. So it's, in, it's similar to the other site. And you can see that for all of these, we've got this um, significant shifting uh, provenance um, through there. I'd like to understand more about what that means. Does, is it related to subglacial meltwater? Uh, what, what does it mean about the extent of the ice margin at that time? So what changes in erosion and hydrology are expected with shifting ice sheets? And how will this affect biogeochemical cycles biota and hazards. In our group, Sean Gullick is gonna show high resolution process information from geophysical imaging. Julia Wellner is gonna be reading the sedimentary record, showing some examples of using proxies for temperature and nutrients, biological activity, and other things to understand the past changes in it around Antarctica. And John Hawkins is gonna um, zoom in on the importance of understanding subglacial meltwater in the, in the modern. And in general, to echo what has been said over and over here, an integrated approach is necessary. 
Modern processes form understanding of expressions left from the past. That's the proxy development. The past evidence provides a much greater ability to understand the full range of states. The historical observations are limited, and especially around Antarctica. Numerical simulations are essential, and observations are essential for guiding them. And Antarctica is a challenging place to work, but its role in global sea level and climate are critical knowledge. Thank you, Sydney. Um, we should now move on to our first five minute um, flash talks, the first of which will be given by Julia Wellner. Julia is an assistant professor at the University of Houston. Hi, thank you. And thanks for that overview, Sid. You heard this morning that I might talk about uh, Amundsen Sea drilling from the JR. And then just now, Sid showed some x rays from our crews there. I'm actually not planning on covering it. And the the reason why is because we didn't make it into the ice covered waters. The JR is not an ice strengthened vessel really in any meaningful way. And it is not the answer to our, our questions or problems here. So what I am gonna show instead is a few different cores that have been collected from the Palmer, each trying to make a different point. So starting with as you heard today, there's efforts to get long ice core records. That's fantastic. But the marine sediment record is always going to be longer than the terrestrial record. Whether you're looking at ice cores or um, sediments, we're always going to be able to get more from the sedimentary record. The example shown here is um, from the Northwestern with LC and it goes from the Eocene to the Pliocene in snapshots. It's not a continuous core. And on the left side of the core figure, we have sedimentology that is showing that we were able to identify um, tidewater glaciation by the late Eocene in the Antarctic Peninsula. And then on the right side of the figure is all new data from Emily Tibbet that's just been published because these cores have been well-preserved now at Oregon State. They still allow modern analysis. And in this case, she's used biomarkers to look at both air and water temperature. And so using these three records from the stratigraphy to the air temperature from soil markers through the sea surface temperature, we're able to reconstruct the different timing of how these things happen. Glacial onset, then air cooling, then ocean cooling, coincident with more global ocean, deep ocean cooling. So the photo on the uh, left of the screen is from the program called Shall Drill. That is the Nathaniel Palmer with a rotary drill rig over the moon pool. The moon pool was cut in the Palmer, for those of you that don't know, in 2004. So 12 years after the vessel was launched, the moon pool was cut in order to facilitate this style of drilling. It worked, we haven't repeated it um, beyond the two legs that it did, but don't worry, I'm not proposing a large moon pool a la the Sir David Attenborough or similar vessels. Rather, I'm trying to show you that sometimes smaller scale solutions creatively applied can allow the um, collection of the data needed. So in this case, modification and um, uh, acquisition of this core. Next slide, please. So another type of coring that is done on the Palmer is piston coring, gravity coring, uh, casting coring. So I'm putting these all in my medium cores uh, that allow access to the deglaciated ice bed. It's hard to get through the ice. It's a lot easier to go get all of these cores from the shelf, and they still allow us to reconstruct past glacial conditions. Uh, the figure from Totten et al. just shows one of an assemblage of the many cores we collected around the peninsula, allowing regional temperature um, and deglacial records. I only have three slides, but four points. So the second one on this slide is that the paleo record sometimes shows us things we've never observed. In the case of the Graham et al. paper, which was from the Thwaites embayment, the paleo record shows us that the ice has retreated faster than we've ever seen it. And going out and getting these shelf records is the only way we're ever gonna know that. 
And so for my final slide, I'd like to show you some of our newest cores. Um, these are from the Thwaites Glacier area as part of the ITGC and Thor project. And so the final type of core we take is a multi-core or mega core. They're not um, extra large, rather they are um, collected in groups of high resolution um, coring that preserves the bottom water and the very upper part of the sediment, allowing us to reconstruct very recent change. So in the long core description, what you see there in a figure that's in second review now in PNAS um, is the core photo, the x-ray down the middle, and then the CAT scans on the right. So x-rays are great, CAT scans are even better. And at the top of that core, we have a lead 210 profile, allowing us to reconstruct the past 100 years or so. And in the big blue bars, I want to draw your attention to work that is um, being done right now by Frankie Pavia, who's looking at the flux of helium-3, or um, interplanetary dust particles, that are coming into the Amundsen embayment. And the red line at the base of the plot there is calculated how much flux of helium-3 or interplanetary dust should there be just from the known melting. The blue bars are what we actually get in the core, suggesting there's a lot more meltwater than observed from calculated melt and um, shows our ability to use cores to know what's happening now. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, we will save our questions for the end, so please enter them in Slido um, as we go along. Um, our next flash talk is by John Hawkins. John is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Um, I hope my bills work, otherwise it's gonna be quite embarrassing. But uh, thank you very much for inviting me to um, present today. Uh, despite the fact that I'm gonna whisper this, I've never been to Antarctica, but uh, I'm gonna do my best to hopefully represent um, some of the research that's been done down there. And I've been lucky enough to have some samples delivered to me to, to analyze. So I'm going to start my story by talking about liquid water underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and this has kind of been talked about a little bit in, in the past uh, day or so. But I just want to um, start by showing you that there is liquid water underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. We've known this for quite a number of years now, going back decades. Um, the most recent estimates of uh, subglacial lakes that might exist on, underneath the Antarctic ice sheet is about 670 subglacial lakes. Um, the blue triangles on this figure at the top here of the Antarctic continent um, show active subglacial lakes, and these are subglacial lakes that we know drain and fill on, on cycles, um, and these lakes are thought to be connected to the continental margins and are likely to deliver fresh water to these, these marginal environments. Um, the lower figure there is from a, a recent paper by Christina Dow, demonstrating that subglacial channels are likely to persist up to 500 kilometers into the Antarctic ice sheet margin, delivering water from the interior of the Antarctic ice sheet to coastal environments in Antarctica. Uh, there's an even more interesting story here, um, and this has just really emerged in the past year or so. Uh, some great work that's been done by Chloe Gustafsson that was published in Science last year, demonstrating that uh, a deep groundwater system likely exists underneath Antarctica as well. So that subglacial lake or kind of ice bedrock interface environment that has liquid water isn't the only place where there's liquid water underneath Antarctica. There's a subglacial groundwater system as well that could likely persist um, up to a kilometer in parts of West Antarctica. And it's likely this groundwater system exchanges water with this overlying freshwater subglacial hydrological system and therefore exchanges things like nutrients and carbon. That's my field gonna work. Okay, so there is some kind of kind of exchange between this subglacial and this groundwater system. This matters because of biogeochemical cycling, um, where there's water, there's lice, where there's water and sediments, there's subglacial um, geochemical weathering. Uh, actually, um, Colleen Hoffman and uh, and Patricia Yeager did a really nice job of um, presenting why iron is important for the Southern Ocean. It's a limiting micronutrient in the euphotic zone of the Southern Ocean. Um, and that's partly what motivates us to study subglacial environments in Antarctica and their importance potentially in delivering 
fresh waters to the, the to the ice margin in the marine environment. And as there's been, there's been a whole raft of really neat research that's been done over the last decade or so, showing active subglacial biogeochemical chemical siping in these environments, um, both hypothesized or modeled, but also uh, measurements from subglacial lake environments and also measurements from the dry valleys in Antarctica. These are just a, a small example of the kinds of studies that have been done. And some of these studies are indicating that subglacial waters that might be delivered to the marginal environments and into the marine environment could be enriched with things like iron. Um, and I'm, this is the only uh, data I'm gonna show you in this, in this short talk. Uh, this is a, um, some data from a publication that we, we put out a couple of years ago, and I've highlighted iron there. This is concentrations of these elements relative to the global river iron mean. Um, and uh, Mercer subglacial lake, where this, these samples came from, uh, there's really, really high concentrations of filtrable iron, up to 10 micromolar of filtrable iron, sometimes higher in some of the samples that we have. Um, and this water is kind of slightly turbid. This is the water after a year of just sitting. It's got really high colloidal particle concentrations. Um, and a lot of these colloidal particles carry some of these important micronutrients that could be important in some of these um, coastal marine systems. Uh, but the only information we have on these subglacial waters in terms of their geochemistry or direct access anyway, uh, is from just two subglacial lakes that have been drilled into uh, in this part of Antarctica, just upstream of the Ross Ice Shelf, um, and a host of uh, studies that have been done in the Antarctic dry valleys. So we're really limited in terms of spatial extent of subglacial meltwater um, end member samples that we have. So being a, a, a non-oceanographer and someone who is possibly unlikely to use this new research vessel, I thought, well, what could be the benefit to my kind of research and my community's research? Um, and I spoke to some of my chemical ocean oceanography colleagues who are interested in some similar kinds of questions. Uh, and these are just some of the ideas that I had that are for discussion later. So I think proximity to the ice front, a lot of other people have talked about this, getting towards the ice front. If we're going to sample, try and sample submarine groundwaters that are coming from underneath the ice sheet or sub, subglacial discharge, we need to get as close to the ice front as we can. Obviously, leading edge science capabilities. I put in here things like trace metal clean facilities. I know uh, the David Attenborough, for example, now has a dedicated clean room for doing um, trace metal work, and I'm not sure if that's a possibility or not for the, for the new ARV. And from a, you know, a selfish perspective, subglacial research, trying to look at questions like how much water is there that's being discharged from underneath the, the Antarctic ice sheet? Where is it flowing to? Um, how far out into the ocean is it guessing? Um, it's residence time and therefore it's geochemical signature. All important questions that I think need answering. And the overarching theme to this really is the biogeochemical importance of subglacial water. Is it important in terms of connectivity between freshwater and, and seawater? And also, can we contextualize um, modern observations in terms of past signals as well, using some of my colleagues' paleo um, archive data? And on that, I'm sorry, I've run slightly over, but thank you. Thank you, John. Um, our next speaker is Sean Gulick. Sean is a research professor at the Institute of Geophysics, associate chair in the Department of Geological Sciences, and co-chair of the Center for Planetary Systems Habitability at the University of Texas at Weston. Great, thanks very much. Um, so my uh, my role here is to talk about subsurface uh, imaging, basically around Antarctica, and I'm going to do this sort of from the distal uh, to the proximal. So the map here on on the top left, all the white lines are existing uh, seismic lines of all different qualities and penetrations. Um, and often we have a pretty good record um, of the distal part of this. So this is just an example, for instance, off the Amundsen Sea that you see. Uh, in the bottom left here that shows this transition from a pre-glacial world to the transitional into a full glacial. And many of our best distal records like Sid talked about, for instance, come from uh, drift deposits, such as the one here shown off Wilkes Land, um, where there's these wonderful ice rafted debris and, and this chance to look at, at the proxies that we can see. But the, the next level of this is to both um, have additional subsurface imaging. So we have the ability to do things like look at this volumetrically, not just in individual single locations. So this example here in the top right off of uh, Fritz Bay is a, is a really good example of that, where if there's dense enough uh, seismic coverage, or even in the future, maybe 3D seismic coverage, you can 
create maps or isopack maps of volumes of sediments that have come off of um, uh, given uh, con you know, conduits or given uh, subglacial basin regions of Antarctica and be able to look at the history of um, the ice and ocean and sediment interactions in the form of their final deposits uh, into the marine environment. Um, and then proxies within these can inform us about changes of the environment through time. So, um, you know, that's just an important uh, argument, I think, for continuing the capability on the new ARV to have the ability to collect seismic data um, and to then tie these sequences into coring and, and, and ocean uh, drilling of one form or another to understand the record. Um, and next slide, please. Unless I can do it. Oh, I can do it. Good. Okay. Um, and, and then as we move a little bit closer, one of the challenges that has been true um, since people have been trying to image uh, the area around Antarctica is that in many cases, the shelf to slope to deep sea transitions um, are very difficult to map across. And here's a good example from the Bellinghausen Sea on the top left, where just the nature of how shallow it gets um, at the shelf edge results in multiples um, getting in the way of mapping the stratigraphy and just the slope sequences being thinner in several cases make it very difficult to make sure that the stratigraphy and the ages that we have of the deep sea can be accurately mapped into the into the shelf. It's, it's pretty uh, doable places like the Ross Sea, but there's a number of locations where either we simply don't have the data that cross the shelf edge or the data um, has challenges to it due to just the geometry of the situation. And so, you know, the, the, the importance of linking the proximal records to the distal record is hard to, to overstate. I think the solution in this that is, is something that's being explored now is increasing use of AUV uh, technology, such as this really great example um, from Ali Graham um, that was, you know, a, a multi-beam bathymetry study to study the, the, you know, the proximal edges of the shelf. But we need to have the ability to potentially think about also doing subsurface imaging with these kind of capabilities, which requires greater power and requires us thinking about things like an A-frame with enough um, oomph to be able to, to deploy the larger um, towed or auto autonomous uh, vehicles, such as uh, just sort of this example down here from the right, which is a currently uh, being studied um, possibility of a, of a deep toed uh, seismic vehicle that might be able to be used in a place um, like Antarctica. And then next slide. Um, so this is uh, then moving into the proximal record. And here we have um, had great successes when we can get into Polinias, we can break through the ice and then deploy data um, within those uh, kinds of environments. And so this is an example from the Totten uh, system on the Sabrina coast of East Antarctica, where we can actually see those transitions. Again, this MS1 to MS2 is this transition from a preglacial to a to a transitional glacial environment with things like tunnel valleys, such as this um, example image from the North Sea uh, from Julian Dowdswell in the bottom right, um, that represent a very meltwater rich kind of glacial environment um, and, and links to thinking about things like the subglacial water systems that we just heard about, and then a transition up to the sort of modern uh, polar uh, systems. But to understand this evolution through time of these different types of glacial systems and what's driving this ice ocean and ice sediment interactions is going to require sampling. Um, and if we uh, think about it just from a standpoint of what type of sampling we can do, the little red you know, dots on here represent what piston coring can do. The, the yellow is then what happens if we get the, uh, the jumbo piston coring kind of capabilities. Um, and then the green represents what happens if we can get something like the Mevo 200 to be launched by our new ARV um, to be able to get these 200 meter sort of penetrations and actually have a chance to really understand um, this kind of record. So, you know, what, what is needed again is, you know, the capability to do the seismic and multi-beam and so on, but also the capability to think about seabed or um, icebreaker-based drilling systems to really get into these proximal records and then tie it back into the deep sea. Uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, we now have 10 minutes for questions, 10-ish minutes for questions. Um, if there's anyone in the audience who has one or any in Slido. We have one from Slido. Oh, you do? Yep, and then if you have a question. Um, this one's for Julia. 
You talked about a coring technique that was best conducted through a moon pool that was cut retroactively in, into the hull of the NBP. Will the lack of a moon pool negatively influence the kind of research you and others in your field might conduct in the future? Potentially, yes. Um, there are multiple ways to achieve that length of coring. And Sean, in fact, just mentioned that there is a, a system called Amiibo 200, which is a seafloor drilling rig. There are also over the side drill systems. So if we consider there to be a combined three different styles of how we might achieve long rotary core drills, drilling um, from an icebreaker, one is on the seafloor, one is over the side and one is through a moon pool. Um, the only one that's you know, achieved some level of success actually through the US Antarctic program so far is Shaldro. It had two cruises in 2005 and 2006, again, immediately after the moon pool. Um, it worked, you know, it would work again. Um, over the side system, um, it looks promising in many ways um, and might be a good solution, but there's a lot of unknowns about how it will operate in different sea states, for example. And then the MIBO systems, the seafloor systems, I see two significant drawbacks to those. Um, I've not used one personally, um, but they have proven only moderately successful in drilling through glacial sediments. Um, they have problems with overcompacted sediments. They have problem with cobbles and ice rafted debris um, and really struggle um, to achieve records there. Um, and then the second problem with amoeba, which may be overcome since my information has um, dated, is that the umbilical on MIBO systems is quite sensitive and it might not function well in a ship that's moving around to avoid ice. So I would say the shell drill style is um, maybe a, a known, reliable, not perfect, but possible system. Thank you, Julie. Okay, um, my question is for John and it kind of mirrors Andy's question, but I was wondering um, what specific observations along coastal margins or key measurements might help you elucidate subglacial processes? And I'm thinking like beyond iron measurements like seepage meters or other parameters that might require a development, um, like sensor development or something like that. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I kind of threw right in at the end uh, something about um, novel biogeochemical sensors, or I might have mentioned sensors. But there's, you know, in, in develop, there are biogeochemical sensors that, are, um, that might be able to perform kind of autonomous measurements of things like iron underneath ice shelves and potentially up to the, the, the grounding line. Um, and we've heard some great talks over the last couple of days demonstrating the power of these autonomous vehicles to get close to the grounding line. Uh, and I think that's a really that's a really great way of potentially getting at some of these subglacial meltwater inputs directly. Um, I'm sure there's also other geochemical traces that could be used, like noble gases, for example. Um, you know, certain isotopic traces as well that could be used to trace subglacial meltwater inputs. So I think it's just combining all those different things. But I think you know, autonomous vehicles with novel biogeochemical sensors in the future, thinking 10, 20 years down the line could be one way of taking some interesting measurements very close to the grounding zone where we expect some of these waters to be coming out. Great, thank you. Um, Matt, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, Sean, can you hear me? There's a question for Sean. Yes, I can. Cool. Uh, Sean, are there any other toad geophysical instruments uh, that we should be thinking about for the ARV that would be complementary to great toad seismic, I'm thinking things like controlled source EM, any other geophysical tools, and what sort of uh, requirements would that uh, have? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. I think uh, controlled source electromagnetic second, methods Sean, are... Muted. Oh. Better? Okay, good to go. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I think controlled source uh, electromagnetic... Nope. Sorry. No. How about now?
Yeah, you guys can, the Zoom there can hear. Yeah. Now we're good. Okay, okay, great. Um, yeah, I think controlled source electromagnetic methods would be a, a great option. Um, it it requires, um, you know, a reasonably sized A-frame and power capabilities, um, you know, to be able to tow the larger um, sources and receiver systems for those. But you could envision that that would actually have the ability to potentially directly sense the, the freshwater connection or the seawater freshwater interface in the subsurface on the shelf edges. And um, as you approach ice margins, I think that would be pretty exciting. Um, and you could conceivably also do that with an AUV component as well. Um, so that's something to, to think about. Um, and then, you know, there's also an opportunity there to pair that with, you know, marine, uh, with, with drilling as well, whether it's a Mebo system or an over the side system. Um, you know, those are, those are something I think we should be thinking about that there's this, not just the stratigraphy, but we have the ability to think about where the water is and can we actually sample, uh, directly into those, those systems for biogeochemical reasons. Thank you, Sean. Okay. All right. So um, we need to move on, but we'll hold your questions in Slido and uh, you can approach our panel afterwards. So I'd like to thank our panel um, for their great talks. And this finishes our last session for today. And we will move into breakout rooms. Similar to yesterday, we will be using that group process of establishing both science priorities and essential capabilities um, called the KJ technique. This method uses the sticky notes we worked with yesterday, um, virtual and physical, to kind of um, facilitate our discussion. Um, we'll spend the first 30 minutes in each session brainstorming and the second um, discussing techniques. So first, please decide if you would like to participate in a breakout room session um, that you see on the screen behind us on global climate and ocean circulation, which is related to our first session today or if you would like to participate in a breakout room session on biota and ecosystems, which is related to our second session, or if you would like to participate in a session on shifting ice sheet and changes in erosion and biogeochemistry related to this session. Um, once you have identified the session you're interested in, please go to the room indicated um, on the slide behind us. Um, and if you find the room full like yesterday, feel free to migrate to another room. Yeah, is there a question there? Um, if you are a moderator, facilitator, or rapporteur, you should report to your assigned room, which is shown here, a reminder that the rapporteur will be reporting back um, at the end of this for a full group discussion. So please take notes. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we, we see the slide. Alex, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, okay, yes. great. Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, we had a small but very uh, intense discussion and, and a very good discussion, I think, um, among this online group. And um, I think in terms of science priorities, while we all have things we are interested and excited about, we all agreed that the very top two science priorities are um, to really get at the CO2 budget, um, the sources, the sinks, um, and how it responds to climate change, and to really understand ice shelf ocean interactions. And these are things that I think are certainly um, important on, on a level that goes beyond all our interests and is important to so society as a whole and the future um, of society on this planet and if and how we can live on this planet. So I think that this is really pressing priority and that came out very clearly uh, in our discussion. Um, three and four are uh, transport processes and CIs and we thought that um, these are the processes basically behind these two priority priorities. So how uh, the ocean circulation modifies um, these components or these priorities, how, how it um, leads to interaction between the shelf and the open ocean, how deep convection works and how upwelling and stratification, um, um, how to understand upwelling and stratification processes basically, um, that, that are all processes that lead to this, um, to the understanding of this first two priorities. And the CIs 
um, is is basically we thought would be an indicator, a very good indicator of of the changes that are ongoing that we can observe and um, have to understand how it varies in order to um, also um, understand the top two priorities. And it's, I, I think I would like to add, it's not just an indicator, but it can also really affect the ocean and, and modify it. So um, yes, I think that's that was our summary of the science discussions in, in terms of capabilities. Um, the three key capabilities that I think we need to answer these questions is first of all to have the access to the ice covered region and I think that came out um, throughout these two days um, and that the ARV needs to be the vessel to do that um, and capability number two is to really extend the range of the vessel while it's going into the ice to be able to observe larger temporal and spatial um, scales around the ship um, including going under ice shelves, for example, going under sea ice, going uh, deep in the ocean, going further away from the ship and coming back and having the capability of deploy the instruments from the ship. Three is um, a capability that we basically need to get at these budgets, I think. Um, we need a network um, throughout the Southern Ocean of different technologies, new technologies, existing technologies, um, tools or platforms um, that provide um, observations that are independent of the ships and that we can use to understand and monitor the wider changes of the Southern Ocean. And we really need um, the ship to, to get to these places and deploy some of these tools but also to maintain them and um, something that also came out that through uh, something that goes through all of this be it uh, science uh, science priorities or capabilities is international coordination uh, we we cannot in as a southern ocean or antarctic community i think we cannot just care about our own sector of the southern ocean um, and and um, do science there or or do um, surveys in this sector, but we have to coordinate. Um, we have to build arrays and sections that are useful to understand the overall budget um, and, and to help each other to maintain this network that we were talking about. And also coordinate in terms of variables that we measure, for example. So I think that's that's most of what we have talked about as a summary. I see international coordination down there at the bottom. Is that what you were talking about at the end? Yes. Yeah. So that's that's there at the bottom, yeah. and we put it at the bottom because really we think it goes over all over all of it. And yeah. maybe one thing to add to this is that we think it should go through existing international um, networks like SCAR or SUS. Um, that are in place to help with this and and that we have to leverage these. Great, thanks. Okay, we'll jump over to Sharon Stammerjohn um, for the, uh, the local session on the same topic. What Alex said. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to see that we pretty much came to the same priorities and capabilities. We may have ordered them a little differently, um, in the sense that we actually just went ahead and grouped everything under everything. Um, so the first one, understanding ice-ocean interactions, for example, heat exchange and cryo cryospheric ocean impacts. So here we're talking about all ice from glacial ice to sea ice. Uh, so it kind of encompasses what Alex just showed, I think, for really his one through four, but three and four that added to the CO2 and um, the ice shelf ocean interaction. So it's hard, I mean, it's gonna be very difficult to kind of express our discussion that we just had because you can imagine it was in a lot of different places. And um, basically one way to summarize that is we kind of wanna look at the whole system and we felt that it was important or I kind of offered this up. So please, anyone in my group chime in, but um, 
you really want to focus on the processes when we're talking about these priorities, because then that gets to the question of what capabilities are needed to address that, right? So that was number one. Number two, understanding sources and sinks of greenhouse gases and the role of the Southern Ocean. So similar to what Alex uh, proposed for the first priority, um, there was also a bit of discussion and this ended up going into uh, priority three, I think, but really what is the ocean's role, the Southern Ocean's role in the global climate system as well. So it's not only understanding how the Southern Ocean is responding, how uh, the sources and sinks of greenhouse gases are changing and actually modifying the Southern Ocean, but then the role of the Southern Ocean in uh, impacting global climate. So hence three, understanding how changes in Southern Ocean circulation and mixing, uh, and, and mixing regulate the global heat budget. So those are our three priorities, pretty, um, pretty uh, broad and uh, very multidisciplinary, I think. Um, so getting to the capabilities. So we have development and support for remote and autonomous platforms, instrumentation for measurement of water column and sub ice shelf processes. So although this says, so, so we have water column and sub ice shelf processes. So we're looking at, again, that whole, you know, we talked about spatial domains and temporal domains, but we're really talking about all the way from, you know, the, the Antarctic ice sheet to the open ocean. And so how can we develop capabilities so that we can support observations that cover that kind of spatial domain? And we also need year round access, right? But so in this particular instance though, remote and autonomous platforms and water column and sub ice shell processes, that's all, it has to be ship-based enabled, right? In order to deploy those platforms, um, calibrate, calibrate those platforms. And so the second capability, access to the coast and the ice shelf, sub ice shelf, um, coastal areas. And that includes, of course, getting off the ship and onto the coastal areas. So some kind of air uh, support likely that would involve. Um, again, and that's all part of the, science priority one and two really. Ability to conduct your own monitoring. And so this was kind of interesting because uh, the ability to conduct your own monitoring that can include really one and two, right? It can include this autonomous um, remote um, platforms and ship-based platforms. So it also can, uh, encompass cyber infrastructure, international multi-agency. Um, so it's, it's a big kind of bucket really. And then lastly, overboarding capabilities for heavy equipment, including, but not limited to more issue, physical and coring, et cetera, which is probably our more specific capability. So I feel like I'm not <laughs> doing our group's discussion justice and I would offer uh, any additional comments. We have, looks like we have, some time, if anybody wants to offer. I think we can agree that what Alex had outlined was very similar to our priorities and capabilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to the um, ecosystem group and it looks like that's uh, Allison. Uh, did you have a merged group also? You're reporting for both or? Is it just one. Yeah. Uh, I think there was one online. Yes. 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 David, sir. But the, we we have one listed here with uh, Eileen too. But those two merged. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Heather did a great job at moderating um, our oh, session. Sorry, David. Today. We're going to start with Allison. Oh. Okay. Bye. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, David. Uh, <laughs> you can you can beat me up later. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the science priorities that we had, we had a, a pretty small group here with lots of thinking. We got to um, it was a good brainstorming session, uh, and I don't think that these are particularly ranked. I think that we they're they're quite evenly ranked. Um, the first though is ecosystem structure, function, and biogeo 
chemical linkages. This had the most stickies associated with it because there, it it really is understanding the ocean um, as as how the in, environment and organisms are functioning together. And so there there was a lot of um, different ideas all under this uh, kind of ecosystem um, bullet item. The next one is adaptation, resilience, and evolution um, with a lot of the ideas that I talked about earlier today, but in, in order to really um, understand um, what is happening, how, how Antarctic organisms, how they're built in terms of their physiological res resilience to um, withstand change and, and, and even to understand some of the really basic properties of how they exist in really high oxygen, super saturated surface waters and high UV. Um, are, there's a lot of really specific uh, Southern Ocean features that bio, biota have adapted and in, in, in getting being able to understand this um, beyond maybe a few model taxa is, uh, I think, important, um, as is understanding the evolution of life. We have a poor understanding of even how many organisms are endemic to the Antarctic. Um, the third uh, item is biodiversity and marine protected areas um, and all of the science that is related really to support Antarctic conservation. Um, this is a big thematic area under SCAR today. Um, but we are knowledgeable about um, a small amount of the biodiversity in Antarctica and the vast amount of it were very, um, is, is holds lots of um, lack barriers to understanding, a lot of it due to access, a lot of it due to our fact that we're normally there in summer. Um, and let's see, I think it changed. We had a slide glitch. There it is. Thank you. Um, and for capabilities, uh, we our first set of capabilities were all sort of under the umbrella of access to the near shore, uh, and, and what hasn't you know similar ideas of what have been said in other groups, um, but also to the deep sea and um, the deep sea environments are widely undersampled in Antarctica. There are a lot of unique habitats, um, seamounts hydrothermal vents, cold seeps, um, the under ice regions, under ice shelves that um, are really interesting from a biological perspective. Um, and I think there was a big theme about having sampling access over uh, over the annual cycle and in, in, in winter specifically. Um, developing sensors and sampling instruments and support systems, um, sensors for biochemistry, about geochemistry, having clean rooms, um, potentially genome sequencing. There's really small little genome sequencers you can stick in your briefcase. Um, ROVs, helicopters, maybe even a submersible, um, or at least a ship that could host a submersible. Um, large volume water samplers, modern net systems for catching but not destroying the plankton you're trying to sample. There's Modern systems for doing in situ cell imaging, biooptical sensors, zooplankton collection. Um, we talked about the need for computational and IT needs, both uh, at sea as well as uh, at our at, on land. Um, having broadband access and potentially a high performance cluster on a ship for doing modeling and if we're doing genome sequencing for doing processing of the data. Um, we talked about teamwork and collaboration and really how important this is on the ship and um, having uh, pre-planning meetings, training highly functional integrated teams to go to see, um, partnering um, and establishing, uh, maybe facilitating international partnerships. Um, both bringing international participants with us, but also us going to uh, sailing with other countries. Uh, we asked the question, is 60 days at sea enough um, for most of the needs that we had? We think so. Um, and we also discussed a little bit of the idea of how the ship is going to work in this sort of ship planning when you have this large ship that can have you know 55 berths what happens when you have small teams and how do you best uh, organize 
um, the use of the ship with small research teams and uh, them working together if they're together or yeah, however that works. Uh, is there anything else that I left out from the people in our group? Great, thanks, Allison. Okay, David, uh, if you're, you're still there, uh, that's it. you had the virtual session on ecosystems. David Ainley. Um, is there another set? Oh, okay. Um, slide. Okay, so we have a relatively small group. Um, we <clears throat> talked about um, integrative studies to better understand um, midwater food webs as well as the connection between um, the midwater food web and the benthos. Um, and we're, I want to say that we're talking here about high latitude coastal ecosystem, which is dominated by continental shelves and slopes. Um, and in this world, um, polinias are biological hotspots. Um, so, but anyway, um, there's been a lot of work on, you know, upper trophic level creatures. And there's also been appreciable work, at least in the Ross Sea, um, on the, on the um, assessment of the composition, species composition of benthic communities. Um, but there hasn't been uh, yet any, like, integration of the two. Um, so that seems to be one um, priority. Um, I think uh, work at McMurdo Sound and particularly Crary Lab has been a hallmark of uh, work on physiology and adaptation of Antarctic organisms, um, as well as the genetic um, at, you know, aspects of these adaptations. Um, and McMurdo, um, you know, is a is is the place um, in the western McMurdo Sound. There's an oligotrophic ocean because the the water there comes out from under the McMurdo ice shelf, and it's as quote unquote gin clear. There's nothing in it, so it is an oligotrophic system, totally different from the eastern sound where the water flows in from the Ross Sea, and it's like soup um and so the the community in the, in the eastern sound is like totally contrast to the western sound and so this offers um an amazing like chance to compare these two sorts of systems um and to you know and so um working on with organisms to how they um cope with these two different types of systems um, would be a, a way to continue to go. Um, and this sort of leads into um, biodiversity of um, organisms. Again, the Rossi is rich in um, critters. Um, it, there's like 400 species were first described in the Rossi, um, but I don't, really don't know how far along gotten in terms of their um, genetic uh, signatures. Um, but um, certainly this is um, an area where there's much potential. Um, so um, those are science priorities. Well, I should say, you know, there's been there's a lot of work at Palmer Station and um, but the and it's really elegant work that's happened there. Um, but the Palmer Station system is not anywhere comparable to the Southern Ross Sea continental shelf system. Um, and so complementary work could um, continue in both areas. Um, and it would that, that's really the contrast is, is really instructive. Um, Okay, so in terms of capabilities, um, well, 
um, you know, I've at least made the case that the Roberto found FASTA is an incredible platform for conducting science. Um, the group talked about having small boat um, access, but I believe that mostly applies to Palmer Station. Um, it, uh, there are, you know, over the years, every once in a while, someone suggests there could be some small boat work in McMurdo Sound, but um, I don't know that logistics and safety considerations maybe put a, a quash on that sort of thing. But, um, you know, further work with Lisa Small Boats over at Palmer um, could well um, enhance the science that goes on there. Um, there and um, in McMurdo Sound, there's incredible access to creatures from the fast ice, um, and there is a a uh, well outfitted aquarium system at at Prairie Lab, um, and so there has been some work on um, you know using live animals and looking at how they adapt to uh, changing the changed ocean, like a warmer water versus colder water. Um, there has been some work at Palmer Station in the aquaria there, but it's that, that system is not as um, well outfitted as the system at um, Prairie. And um, so some work could be done there um, to improve the systems at Palmer. Um, and that sort of gets into the third um, attribute here, which pretty much I, I covered. Um, McMurdo, McMurdo system has been underutilized over the last 10 years or so um, for reasons beyond my pay grade. Um, um, and um, as I said, the, um, the, the aquaria at Palmer apparently need some uh, work to make them more uh, amenable to um, additional or further or continued research. Uh, I think I covered what we covered. Um, so, thank, thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Okay, we'll move on to. Uh, one of the sessions on erosion that met in room 120. Um, so that raptor is Sydney Hemming. I think it's both oh, of Or are you going to tag team it? Oh, you combine. Yeah. OK. <laughs> you, we, we got a tag team <laughs> with John Hawking. So the, <laughs> let the mud wrestling begin. <laughs> you want me to stop? Okay. Yeah. The one that's up is actually the virtual yeah, one. Yeah, uh, virtu uh, Sean, you're, you did run the virtual session, Sean? Yeah, and that's yeah, the okay. There we go. We'll, we'll, we'll get first. to you in a minute. Oh, Thanks. Okay. Yep. So there were two of us. Okay, perfect. Um, so our three science priorities were uh, are kind of interlinked and kind of go hand in hand with each other. Uh, I think in no particular order, really, um, apart from the number of votes that they got each. But when we had a discussion, they kind of all came out around a similar kind of priority level. Uh, the first is current sediment delivery processes and provenance. Um, so where the sediment is coming from today, so it's contemporary processes, what is its composition, um, erosion rates underneath the ice. Uh, then we're going on to... Uh, past ice and paleoclimate, uh, how much, how fast, and that's basically taking the knowledge that we gain from the process studies for current uh, sediment delivery and the proxies that are developed as a result um, and uh, and connecting that to uh, uh, coring records of the the sediments offshore. Again, help, helping to feed into that is the the um, provenance of the sediment that we uh, that we thought were priority for contemporary processes. Then the final one we have is subglacial, and we kind of group that in, into groundwater, freshwater uh, fluxes, and terrestrial hydrology. Um, so that's really about subglacial meltwater flux from the ice to ocean, again, contemporary based uh, with a terrestrial hydrology focus. How much water is there? Um, what is its composition? Where is it coming out? 
Uh, it's really important for things like stratification, but also coastal chemical composition, uh, and also a number of physical processes are strongly tied to the amount of meltwater coming out subglacially, such as circulation underneath the ice shelf, ice shelf melt. Um, and again, the that time back into informing us about past ice and paleoclimate as well. And then onto capabilities. Yep. Uh, high priority for capabilities is being able to do uh, drilling and coring. Um, and that's basically so that we can obtain um, sedimentary records um, near the ice on the shelf and even offshore and get uh, long and continuous records. Uh, we want to be able to look at um, the, the processes and the time scales of processes. I think it's, as well, because this keeps on coming up amongst you know both days and a lot of different groups. Um, Amy Laventa would mention that there's kind of a strong need for a workshop, particularly on, on drilling processes and options in the future that should involve both scientists and, and engineers and you know an international um, cohort for that as well. Um, and I believe the design team has been talking to the OSU core rep repository for that um, to figure out kind of drilling options into the future. The second one is again come has come up quite a number of times, but that's AUV, ROV, stroke drone support. Um, and we talked about the making sure that deployment recovery and tracking infrastructure is incorporated into the vessel, which I'm sure it will be. Uh, but also things like deck space and electronics. There's gonna be a lot of deck space on the vessel already, which is great, but making sure the electronics are, you know, state of the art and able to tie in quite closely with deploying these kinds of um, these kinds of vessels. Um, and we also talked about uh, potential sampling and sensing capabilities for these drones. Um, so remote sampling of water and sediment underneath the ice shelf in particular, and getting close to the grounding line, as, as close to the grounding line as possible. And also incorporating next generation sensing, both kind of funding to support the um, development of next generation sensing. So biogeochemical sensors, which again came up in, a, in, in one of the previous um, discussions. And uh, shipboard geophysics, and also that's basically to connect the dots between the modern processes that are going on and the the sort of preparation for um, exploring with the uh, sediment cores as well. So we think that the ship ought to have uh, capability for doing um, surveys with seismic, and we also think that it should support um, geophysical measurements from the um, any AUV or ROV. Um, capabilities. And the final thing that we discussed in terms of capabilities is that we knew that the new research vessel would be a class three icebreaker, which is great, but it was brought up a couple of times that um, station keeping is very important, particularly for uh, facilitating some of the drilling um, capabilities that we, we thought would be really important in terms of the, the science priorities. And just in general, it was brought up and we all agreed that it, having sustained, sustained support for the engineering and design modeling ability to support the um, the um, ROVs and AUVs and communications would be really important to keep in mind. I hope we hit all the key pointers, but if anyone else in the group has anything else they want to mention. Great, okay, thank you. We'll move on uh, to hear from the, the virtual session on uh, erosion that, um, was has rapporteur Sean Gulick out in the great ether. thanks can you hear me yeah great uh, do we, uh I you think other you slide. Have your slide yet no it was just there there. there it is perfect okay so uh we had a small but um very engaged group um and kind of fairly quickly narrowed in on some really key science priorities uh, under these these topics. Um, primarily was, um, or number one was mapping and characterizing the eroded products from, from, from the glacial systems. Um, and so that's on sort of all scales and and both time and space. So both proximal and, and to the to the distal record. Um, we that that we also then had a key priority in the world of, of meltwater fluxes. So understanding meltwater fluxes, their properties, the pathways in the marine environment, both you know um, at the seabed, but also being able to characterize what's happening under the ice shelves. 
And then both of these things, understanding the sedimentary uh, record and understanding meltwater um, kind of feed into the effort that's required in modern glacial dynamics and ice sediment interactions. That's probably really critical to understanding the whole system. Um, just not directly the capability required for the ship, but from a science perspective, it's really important that those communities um, continue to talk. Some areas that we didn't spend as much time on, partly just to who was in the room, um, were the hazard side. You know, we mentioned the the hazards of of large icebergs, um, hazards of submarine failures, um, but just mentioned them. Also talked about the need to probably better understand the solid ice flux process and even the mechanism of delivery of of ice rafted debris, since that's one of our proxies once we get to the deep sea. Um, in terms of capabilities, uh, had also a lot of agreement. Um, and we kind of tried to group them a little bit. So one is, you know, the ship-based observational capabilities, all the, the things you would expect, the CTDs, multi-beam systems, sub-bottom profilers like CHIRPs, um, ADCPs, and long goring systems that would be part of the ship facilities, but then also the ship's capability to deploy key systems such as seismic reflection um, systems, controlled source electromagnetics, um, drilling uh, systems such as, as the MIBO or, or if there was an over the side possibility, um, AUVs, um, and then even the possibility of thinking about small vessels where the ship could be a mothership, not just for AUVs or ROVs, but also potentially for small vessels that could go in and do either on ice teams um, or or proximal sampling. Um, so so sort of thinking about this as a a bit more uh, flexible space where it can be kind of a mothership, if you will, both for AUVs and for crewed operations. And then all of these require, you know, the obvious things, enough deck space for things like the AUV vans, for the seismic systems, or if the, the compressors are not built into the hull, then, then you need space for those. And then bunk space, because a lot of these kinds of uh, systems require a lot of technical support in addition to the science support. And then storage, if we're going to do quite a bit of coring or quite a bit of, you know, drilling related activities, you <clears throat> need space to put the cores. So that's a really key uh, constraint, I think. And then looking out into the future, you know, future technological developments are really needed in this world of AUV, especially for AUV based imaging and sampling in these kind of environments. Um, but then also, if you ever did a, not a seabed drill, but a over the side drill, then we would need to think about uh, automatic heave compensation as a technological development in that setting. Um, and I completely occur with the comment about potentially a workshop in this area of the best way to do drilling in the Antarctic would be excellent. And I think uh, I didn't, if I missed anything, hopefully the group will will chime in. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Sean. Uh, okay. Thanks uh, to all of our rapporteurs and uh, everyone who participated in the, in the breakouts. We, we are going to have a 15 minute break now uh, and, but stick around, there's more. And we did change up the, the afternoon uh, integrated uh, discussion a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna pass to Caroline here who will explain that to everyone. All right, um, for the last breakout, um, we're gonna have one in-person breakout room and that's going to be in the lecture hall. Um, we will, as Alan said, have a break. So here it's 3.15. We'll please be in the lecture room um, at 3.30. We'll come back here um, following, or at, we'll have our breakout room until 4.15 and then come back and we'll do the last report outs. Um, any? And there's a virtual um, uh, version as well, uh, run from room 114. And, and just one one thought as you're going into the break and into the breakout rooms, um, we're gonna have the discussion kind of uh, around looking at all of the different uh, capabilities that came out of the other session rooms. All right, ready break. So we really value everybody's diligence and input and thoughtful responses over the last couple of days and can't thank you enough for all of your help. The science talks were just phenomenal as was the discussion. So I greatly appreciate it on behalf of the committee. Second, um, thank you to NSF for showing up and supporting um, and answering lots of questions and being there to help us through our thought process um, so we can get the best report that's the most impactful for what they would like to achieve. And then lastly, just a final thank you to all of the staff um, from the National Academies for just a phenomenal job. Um, Margot, 
um, Miles, Caroline, everybody who supported it, the breakout sessions. Um, this just went so smoothly. So I can't thank you all enough. Okay, so rapporteurs, or really rapporteur, um, could you please come and sit at the table? And I don't know, did the virtual have an in-person rapporteur? Okay, so both of you. Or online. Oh, online, okay. So we have one person online and one person. And I think, is Mo gonna do the brief out or I don't know. If she's not here, we could start with the, okay. So um, so we'll now hear from the session that met in the boardroom um, and the rapporteur for that was um, Mo Walzak. Please, um, <laughs> it says, please keep your remarks to five minutes, but I think you can utilize the time to the extent you need to, because we only have two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, go, can do. I can go, I mean, like Alan is, I can talk super fast. Okay. All right, so um, I uh, was trying to follow a very fast paced conversation and work things into organizational structure that maybe is wrong. So let's just start with this and see where we go. So I have first critical science needs. We critically need to understand how much sea level rise and how fast that sea level will rise or how fast that sea level rise will occur associated with retreat of Antarctic outlet glaciers and failure of the Antarctic ice sheets. We need to understand interactions between the ocean and Antarctic cryosphere, ranging from sea ice and floating ice shelves to the interior of the ice sheet to better predict stability of these environments in the periods of the future. We specifically note that grounding zone processes are of critical importance in constraining these uh, processes because why not say processes a lot. We need to accurately understand with the greatest degree of precision possible air-sea gas exchange in the Southern Ocean. This is essential to understanding one of the largest non-geologic sinks and potential sources of greenhouse gases in the world. As an extension of all these processes combined, we need to understand how changes in global climate and ice sheet stability will feed back into changes in circulation in the Southern Ocean, which in turn impacts global heat budget and CO2 budgets. Last but not least, we need to document and understand the Antarctic and Southern Ocean biosphere, which is among the most productive on Earth and we believe is changing rapidly due to increasing fishing pressure, tourism, and climate change. We note developing an understanding of these deeply interconnected dynamic systems critical to our economic and national security requires coordination and collaboration between the oceanographic and geologic glaciologic community. Without the comprehensive access to the Southern Ocean, Antarctic continent and its underlying sedimentary records to be supported by this vessel, we are ceding critical societally relevant global scientific leadership. We note that Norway, Australia, the UK, South Africa, China, Italy, India, France, and Korea, among others, have Antarctic research vessel platforms that exceed current American capabilities. So with regards to critical ship-based infrastructure, the development and support of AUV and ARVs are considered critical for Antarctic research needs across the board. But we also need to be thinking about potential use of the vessel over its entire lifetime and ability to serve future needs with long-term and year-round monitoring. The ship should ideally be capable of deploying and servicing um, such as would be served by semi-permanent infrastructure, for example, moorings, cabled arrays, acoustic networks, and other types of instruments yet to be determined, capable of capturing a variety of processes over a full annual cycle. We also need the ability to support divers, including a decompression chamber. We need access to the seafloor, understanding the paleoenvironmental record of ocean temperature, circulation, productivity, sea ice cover, and ice sheet retreat is a critical component of understanding processes that occur beyond the observational scale and constraining dynamics in warming worlds where ice sheets have destabilized in the past. This will require infrastructure to support long-term, long sediment core collection as well as deep sea drilling. We reviewed the capabilities from different sessions and discussed recurring cross-session themes of a need for ice shelf, shore, and archipelago access, but also shallow water down to around 50 meter access when sea ice conditions will allow. Emphasis on the point that without the ability to use this vessel to some extent as a mothership, we will be disenfranchising a significant portion of the scientific community and the important science they do. Emphatic importance is on a highly capable workboat, but we also have need for a helicopter as there is really no other way to access ice shelves. Fast blowing and grounded ice is dangerous with fixed wing, uh, fixed wing craft. We need to be able to access ice camps over 20 kilometers from shore for geodetic and geological sampling and areas armored by heavy over 1.5 meter sea ice. We note that undersubscription of helicopter capabilities is likely a result of institutional dysfunction. This would be addressed if there were interdisciplinary calls for helicopter access. Finally, a lack of helicopter capability is a safety issue in the most remote field environment on Earth. There is attention to the need to scale, there is attention to the need to scale the operational budget to maximize the capabilities of the ship. 
But as part of this, what are the costs of not developing infrastructure to service shore and ice shelf based science and limiting that access to just McMurdo and Palmer? The same core programs will ultimately have to cover the complex logistics and extensive costs of reaching remote parts of the Antarctic margin and continent from these two stations via helicopter or other methods if the science needs to be done, which we all believe it does. We would submit that for the vessel to be maximally efficient in service of US science interests and our funding agencies, we don't just need the ability to land a helicopter, we need the ability for sustained support. We recognize this would involve mobilization costs and fuel. Are there other considerations that we are failing to understand with regards to why the design cannot include shore-based access? We would appreciate a dialogue with NSF on this point and feel we can provide robust scientific justification for this capability in support of a request for congressional appropriation adequate for meeting the actual needs of the US Antarctic scientific community. Could interagency partners be identified to help support these costs? And if additional funding is flatly impossible, what would we have to sacrifice to get this capability? And are those sacrifices acceptable? Finally, we have non-ship based but still critical infrastructure for Antarctic research. Other important community needs include upgrading experimental facilities at McMurdo and Palmer. We also need ongoing continuous support for modeling and engineering. We need those support, we, and those need to be supported at a community-wide or facility basis as opposed to being sporadically supported through individual projects. This directly ties to the need for improved sustained cyber infrastructure for data management to facilitate biological and ecosystem data integration. Data management architecture of GoShip and R2R could be a good model for this. That's all I got. <laughs> And just so for the official record, the things that were happening very quickly at the end was a discussion of how operational considerations need to be a part of this, um, as well as uh, the importance of balancing not just scientific leadership, which a lot of this is focused on, but also um, uh, basically uh, economic uh, interests and uh, and autonomy, as well as national defense. And so those com those all combine in terms of uh, the appropriateness of assuming that international collaborators are the solution for all of our uh, needed extensions of the logistics of this vessel. So it's a great opportunity to do that. Um, the other things that came up were the opportunities. So it was mentioned a bit about um, specific calls for helicopter-based uh, um, uh, in yeah bas basically in for. Uh, cruises that would include specifically that capability versus requiring um, folks to propose for an entire cruise. So this this might be a way to maximize that investment. Um, and then an additional uh, thought was in, is it basically in, in using that both as a, a science platform, but also to increase the range of the vehicle or the vessel itself. So there was a few other points that were made at the very end and wanted to make sure that we caught those. Is there anything else? I'm going to put in the AG Noah or NASA. Yeah, sorry. the 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 point was that Noah and and NASA would be necessarily um, supportive of such an such an endeavor, but it's most likely the responsibility of NSF in going into that um, Antarctic support budget. Yeah, I will email these notes to the all the rapporteurs from the session, and we can have a crack through them and then send them over. That sounds good. Thank you. Great. Just um, on that last point, um, we had just started in that session getting into the interagency international collaboration and support. And I think Allison mentioned there's now a high level working group between NASA and NSF about improving collaboration in many areas. Um, and I will say, you know, from my past experience, having multiple agencies come to um, a budget discussion hearing or something like that and agreeing that something for one agency is a priority and it's important for the U.S. in general is a very powerful thing to happen, okay? So even if there weren't to be any financial support, um, having unilateral support for investment in one agency for a capability that's national is actually extremely important. Um, so thank you. That was a wonderful report back. I think we're going to hear from our other rapporteur online, Doug Weens. Hello. Um, 
so we had a spirited online discussion um and uh you know we dis we didn't discuss so much the science needs um but more how well we didn't discuss the science itself but we did discuss how the science needs went across many of the different um groups so almost all the groups talked about access to land and sea ice um you know preferably uh, in many cases with a helicopter um people noted that um you know there's some comment about how infrequently helicopters have been used but that is because of the way that they're managed and they've been requested many uh many times and not been available uh people noted that helicopters are permanently uh located on other ships like the polar stern um and they also noted that there's sort of different uh ways of operating uh different ships and the the question is how will the you know how will the uh, arv be operated you know 20 uh 15 to 20 years from now will it be the pi the single pi model that we usually use in the us or is it like a collection of groups uh like um, some other countries use these are all sort of things to consider but in terms of the access question people noted that many areas like uh, especially east antarctica coastal regions uh, or grounding lines where there's a lot of uh, crevasses and so forth can really only be reached uh, by sea um, and so the ship um, needs to have a capability to uh, help us reach these areas otherwise we can't reach them at all um, and uh, you know it the feeling of the group was that the needs for access hadn't really been adequately considered uh, so far. Um, and uh, there, there really needs to be a study that, um, you know, that would show the trade-offs of, of maybe incorporating uh, different sizes of helicopters possibly um, on the ship and how that would trade off with other capabilities um like things like do we really need 55 births and so forth um if it if it means giving up access to large parts of the earth um so that was uh, a pretty extensive discussion um <clears throat> we also talked about uh drones and that's a really exciting uh thing that will develop considerably over the next uh 15 years um they're currently not people pointed out they're currently not useful really due to the regulations very tightly regulated their uses um and they're also uh, technically not capable enough to do a lot of the work that we would want to do say out of helicopters or fixed wing uh, aircraft um but they'll probably evolve substantially over the 10 to 15 years before the ARV becomes operational and so there needs to be a lot of design flexibility built into the ARV to um to accommodate where the drones evolve um in the next uh you know in the next um 10 to 15 years so that um they're the, the that we're not kind of locked into some idea of how the drones are going to operate which might be uh you know obsolete by 10 to 15 years from now um another thing that we talked about was uh the need for uh, crustal scale uh, seismic imaging um, and it was unclear to us from looking through the documents we were given uh, whether there was uh, capabilities for that uh, such as built-in compressors um, a capability for large uh, streamers uh, on the ship and uh, you know so that's something that probably needs to be evaluated uh, whether um, you know those capabilities um, would be available uh, given the current design. Um, and finally, uh, it was mentioned that a really important capability that we sometimes don't think about right away is uh, communication capability, the ability to send large volumes of data back uh, from the ship in real time um, is really an essential uh, thing. All right. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. And I loved slightly different perspectives than the other group, which is really super helpful. Um, questions, last minute thoughts by anybody? Everybody's ready for a beer. I don't blame you. All right. Well, that marks the end of our workshop. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the committee and have a very safe trip home, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>